I can only find one way to make a bigger noise. First thing I want to ask you to do is please look at your microphones and mute all of them, please. So, so the red Not light already. should be on. Yeah. So at this point, I would uh, like to call the uh, meeting to order and ask you all please to join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. So before we do the roll call, let me get the uh, stupidity out of the way. It doesn't do a lot of good to grab your glass case and then get all the way down here 20 miles later and figure out there's nothing in it. <laughs> and since I can't read without glasses, I am wearing these. <laughs> And the Bob Roth factor was already up on the photo, so if you missed it, for those of you who came in late, I will get even with him in one way or another. So at this point, Ms. Garcia, would you please take the roll? Eva Henry? Here. Jeff Baker? Here. Peace Jones? Deb Gardner? David Beacom? Here. Randy Wheelock? Sean Wood? Nicholas Williams? Here. Kevin Flynn? Here. Roger Partridge? Here. Ron Engels? Libby Zabo? Here. Bob Pfeiffer? Here. Bob Roth? Here. Larry Vidham? Here. David Spellman? Aaron Brockett? Here. Fargo Ramsden? Here. Lynn Baca? Here. Roger Hudson? Here. George Teal? Yes. Emmy Mauer? Here. Catherine Heider, Laura Christman, Richard Champion, Gail Christie, Rick Teeter, Here. Debbie Nasta, Catherine Whitman, Steve Conklin, Linda Olson, Here. Jeff Deacon, Mark Gruber, Daniel Dick, Carolyn Scharf, Drew Peterson, Bobby Sindelar, Lisa Jones, Laura Brown, Lynette Kelsey, Here. Pat Norquist, Here. Jim Dale, Paul Hazeman, John Rakowski? Present. Mike Hillman? Stephanie Walton? Present. Dana Goodwine? Jacob LeBure? Jerry Bean? Isaac Levy? Brina Elrod? Here. Jacob Lofgren? Larry Strzok? Here. Quinn Shaw? Here. Joan Peck? Here. Ashley Stolzman? Here. Connie Sullivan? Here. Joyce Palazuski? Paul Sutton? Sean Forey? Chris Larson? Jordan Sowers, Julie Mullica, John Dyack, Here. Sally Daigle, Roberta Mooney, Rita Dozal, Mark Laces, Jessica Sandgren, Herb Atchison, Here. Ed Starker, Here. Adam Zarin, Deborah Perkins Smith, Here. Bill Van Meter. We have a quorum. At this time, I would move a motion for the approval of the agenda. I have a second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Motion carries. Moving on, let's start with the report uh, of the Regional Transportation Committee. That committee met uh, yesterday morning. The items that were uh, reviewed there are in your package tonight. We'll be going through those in detail, so I'll curtail till we get to those items. Next item of report is the Chair of the Performance and Engagement Committee. Mr. Dyack. Thank you, Chair. Um, we uh, continued our Executive Director Performance Evaluation. Uh, Executive Director Rex uh, presented actual objectives. And um, one note I would like to make, uh, uh, Jerry Stiegel uh, sent out a collaborative assessment. We would like uh, for each board member to uh, take a look at that and uh, execute that, uh, that collaborative assessment. Uh, July 20th is the deadline. Looking to have good participation. Okay, thank you, sir. Any comments or questions on the report from the chair? If not, we will move to the. Yes, ma'am. Great question. I got my uh, my reminder. Uh, I think two days ago. Uh, I'm looking for. Yeah, it went out July sixth. Get it? Aura. We can send out a reminder tomorrow. I'm looking for Jerry. I don't see him. We can send out a reminder tomorrow with the link, Jerry. Yep. Mr. Dyack, thank you. Miss Dolsman, please. The Finance and Budget Committee did not meet. 
going through this room around all stuff to do. Executive director has a report that's about nine pages long, so everybody needs to get coffee, try to do it during the report. <laughs> Well, Rex, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It is a, a page and a half, so it is shorter than normal, and you're welcome. Um, so, punch list with the office. I, it seems like most people were able to get here again this evening, so thank you all for coming. I am not going to guarantee that the lights won't shut off. There's a chance they could shut off at 8 o'clock, um, but we think we have that resolved, as well as the mystery screen raising up and all that kind of good stuff, so hopefully everything goes as planned. As the... Um, as the chairman mentioned, yeah, what we decided to do with the microphones is to basically mute those until such time that you want to speak. So it, that way we'll reduce the, the amount of feedback and all that kind of good stuff. So thank you all very much for your patience. And please laugh again like you did last month if, this, if the lights go off. Uh, a lot of people working really hard to try to get those fixes done. Um, for new board members, and I know we have several over the, since the last uh, election cycle, um, we will be mailing out a survey link in the next week or so. Um, and it's part of our onboarding process, so we want to, uh, you know, we, we continually are trying to um, improve, and we'd like your feedback in that respect. Um, some of the stuff regarding whether, you know, the mentoring program, whether you took advantage of that, um, some of the orientation sessions, and, and, you know, just some general information that's feedback for us that will help us improve our, uh, our process um, for onboarding um, of our new members. Um, we have a number of uh, uh, materials at your desk this evening. The first I would like to mention is the Citizens Academy. Um, we are, we believe we have, it's a privilege that we, we were asked to, um, to actually carry on this tradition of the Citizens Academy from the Transit Alliance, which they, they shuttered their doors um, earlier this year. We, um, we are already starting to advertise that our Fall Citizens Academy, which will occur, um, the f well, it will start um, on Thursday, September 27th, and it will be um, seven consecutive Thursdays. So it's a, it's a pretty good commitment. And what my ask, I think, from you all today is if you have residents within your communities that you feel might, um, one, would like to do something like this, but two, you think would be beneficial to them, to please, you know, reach out to that those individuals and um, you know, and ask them to submit their applications. Um, applications are now they're not open yet. They're open August August first. So uh, so please do so, and we'll be reaching out and probably send you some information as well, so you can do that. Yes. Um, the question is, is what time of day will it be? It starts at 6 o'clock, and it'll typically, how many hours? Oh, it ends at 9, so, yeah. Thank you. Yep. Um, the uh, board workshop. I hope everybody has signed up for the board workshop. If not, um, please do so as quickly as possible. Our workshop is August 24th, 25th in Keystone this year. Um, the deadline for reservations for the group rate um, will end on Tuesday the 24th, so this upcoming Tuesday. And we, um, the agenda is also available at your pack, packet today. Well, I know we sent it out also, but um, if you have any questions about that, please let me know. We feel we have an excellent program this year. We have a good mix of very good discussion topics as well as some outside speakers that I think you'd be interested in. So if you, if all possible and you can make that, please do so. It's, I think those who have attended those in the past will tell you it's a good opportunity, if nothing else, to learn some good information and also to socialize with your, with your fellow board directors. Last but not least, a um, little bit of information on the Iraqi youth delegation. Um, for those of you that are part of the partnership, you would have received an email from Connie um, a, a week or so ago. Um, so the, uh, just a reminder that the Iraqi youth delegation visit is on Tuesday, July 24th from 10 to 12.30. Um, and the theme of this delegation is peace building and community resilience. Lunch will be provided from 11.30 to 12.30. Um, so please RSVP to Connie if this is something you're interested in attending. And with that, Mr. Chairman, that is my report. For those of you who uh, I know, uh, Bob Roth and myself have had a great opportunity to interact with these young people over the last couple of years, and I would tell you, it is extremely informative. They are, they have no problem asking questions as long as they don't have the government oversight with them. But if they have that, we usually try to find a way to discourage that person to leave the room for a while. But I would tell you, it's very informative what they ask. They're not bashful about trying to find out all the information they can about how we as local governments work. 
and they are very, very talented young people. So if you have the opportunity to come down and be a part of that, please uh, make some time, get in touch with Connie on that. The other thing Doug did mention about uh, the retreat that we've got coming up, it's important that you register, but it's just as important you make your hotel reservations so that you can stay in the same hotel. So yeah. please make those. Um, let me take a short pause. We have a new member uh, joining us today, starting with uh, Mr. Nicholas Williams, who's the Deputy Chief of Staff for the Department of Public Works, his new, new appointee from the City and County of Denver. So, Nicholas, thank you and welcome. <laughs> At this time, we this will be open for public comment. We have up to 45 minutes is allocated now for the public comment, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes. If there are additional requests for the public to address the board, time will be allocated at the end of the meeting to complete public comment. At this time, I also request that there be no public comment on issues for which a public meeting has prior been held before it with this board. Consent and agenda actions will begin immediately up after the last speaker. Do we have anyone from the public who wishes to make comments? Yes, sir, please go ahead. Uh, my name is Randall Loeb. I'm a citizen here in Denver. I have been for 30 years, I guess. Uh, I was homeless for many years. Uh, I work uh, all the time in various capacities. It hurts my heart that so many youth and families are in this situation. I have a friend who lives in the basement of a place that's uh, not well run uh, by a man who basically wants her out because he wouldn't fix his hot water tank, which was leaking all over the place. Um, she has a 12-year-old um, daughter. She used to work for the Salvation Army, and um, I'm on the advisory committee of homeless youth of the state of Colorado on the executive uh, board, and it seems to me that no child of any age, in any circumstance, single woman with children, whatever, um, older, um, whatever is their circumstance, should be in a situation where they have to um, worry about living in a shelter. And I would advise us all, uh, since we lost the uh, federal claim in uh, uh, Lakewood, to uh, create housing for families and things, to create um, places for people that are safe. It it's our responsibility. I was at the State of the City address, and the mayor made a lot of promises to do so. And I remember very um, squarely you and being introduced in his uh, uh, talk. and. I really feel uh, it's our time to collaborate as I am a member of the council also of the city and county of Denver on homelessness to come up with strategies that are regional. I was at a meeting just upstairs and we were talking about regional transportation and working together. I'd like to be a part of the Citizens Academy actually and I've been involved in public work for over 20 years in extreme poverty. <coughs> So I plead with you to really consider these things seriously. And I am very honored to be here. This is the third edifice I have come to to address you. Go well, stay well. Is there anyone else who has any comments from the public that they'd like to make at this time? I'm seeing none. Next item on the, is uh, item number eight on your agenda. This is the move for an approval of the consent agenda. Do I have a motion? So moved. I have a so moved. Do I have a second? Second. I have a motion and a second. All those in favor, aye. Aye. Any opposed? Hearing none, the motion is carried. Moving on to the agenda, we'll move to item number nine. This is attachment B. Mr. Cottrell, would you please? So, fancy new technology. All right, hopefully that works for everyone. Um, attachment B contains amendments to the 2018-2021 uh, Transportation Improvement Program. Um, for your consideration this evening, there is five amendments. Uh, the first amendment, or actually the, I should say the first two amendments are both for RTD, and both of these amendments will update the control total funding levels. The third amendment, again, is also by uh, consideration by RTD. This is the Fast Tracks Eagle P3 project. This amendment would add additional new starts funding to meet the full appropriations that were awarded. In addition, 
um, that we would shift the funding to FY19 per a request by FTA. Um, the Fourth Amendment, very similar to the first two, also sponsored by RTD, where this amendment updates the control total funding levels. And finally, the last amendment for your consideration this evening is a project by CDOT Region 1, the I-25 capacity improvements from Castle Rock to the El Paso County line. This amendment would, would remove $92 million of Senate Bill 267 funding and replace it with Senate Bill 1 funding due to ongoing litigation with Senate Bill 267. In addition, we would also move all the funding to uh, fiscal year 19. So these are the amendments for your consideration this evening. Um, both the TAC and the RTC have both recommended approval, and I'd be happy to take any comments or questions that you may have. Mr. Contrell said the RTC did vote unanimously to move this forward to the board. Any other comments or questions from Mr. Contrell before we take a motion? Mr. Rakowski has made the motion to approve. Mr. Teal has made a second. Any other questions or comments from the board? Seeing none, all in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Seeing none, the motion is carried. Next item will be item C. Mr. Cottrell, you're still on the clock. Thank you. Um, this item refers to the 2018-2019 uh, Unified Planning Work Program, or UPWP. Uh, this is a document that staff is federally required to prepare every two years and essentially is the MPO work program. Um, the changes, you know, the amendments to this document are in track changes and are included within your agenda packet as a link. Um, just want to hit on a, highlight a few amendments that are um, more major in nature as concerned to just minor wordsmithing changes. Um, the first is in section or activity 1.3. Um, it notes that Dr. Cog will participate as one of the partner agencies in the Mobility Choice Blueprint. The second is an Activity 4.2, which would establish the FAST Act required performance targets. Mr. Chairman, uh, if I may, Todd, real quick. Um, in case, we, we provided a link to this document in your packet. In case you don't have it electronically, we do have some hard copies of the document. Those who would like to have one, please raise your hand and I'll get it to you. <laughs> Go ahead, Todd. That's all right. Now, the last two uh, changes I would uh, just refer to the back of the document in Appendix A. Um, table 1 updates the fiscal year 19 CPG funding levels. Um, we've also updated the, um, the, the carryover funds from the previous contract. And in addition, on Table 4, which is a key Dr. Cog deliverables, and that's been updated accordingly. Um, so with that, uh, I would take any comments or questions you may have. And again, TAC and RTC have both recommended approval. Again, the RTC voted unanimously to move this one forward to the board. Any comments or questions for Mr. Cottrell on this item? Bless you. Seeing none, motion, Mr. Mr. Rakowski has moved the motion. Second. Second. I have a Mr. Vittum on the second. Any comments or questions from the board? Being none, all those in favor, please signify by aye. aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is carried. Before we start the discussion on the next one on the list of PAP doors, I will uh, let you know that at the TAC, when this was reviewed, there was one no vote out of the board. And at the RTC, there was also one no vote. The two no votes were not cast by the same groups. So. Mr. Pap Doris, if you will, please. Good evening, members of the Board, uh, pleasure to be here. Ron Papstorf, Director of Transportation Planning and Operations here at Dr. Cog. Um, I expect this to go just as smoothly as your first two action items. Uh, this item does deal with um, Senate Bill 18-001, uh, 
uh, the funding, transportation funding legislation passed by the legislature uh, this legislative session and particularly deals with uh, a funding component of that bill called the Multimodal Transportation Options Fund. Uh, there is a fair bit of uncertainty around transportation funding uh, right now, uh, partly as a result of Senate Bill 1 that depends on what happens in November with potential uh, transportation funding ballot initiatives. Uh, but what we do know from Senate Bill 1 is that there are general fund transfers to transportation improvement purposes as a result of uh, Senate Bill 1. So uh, tonight's discussion is about one component of those general fund uh, transfers as a result of Senate Bill 1 in order to uh, allow us to move forward with a component of that funding. Too close. Um, so um, by way of overview of Senate Bill 1 and the general fund transfers included in Senate Bill 1, um, there are transfers that happen in fiscal year 18, which began July 1 of this year, and fiscal year 19, beginning of July 1 of next year. Um, those transfers are $495 million this year and $150 million in 2019. Of those general fund transfers, the bulk goes to the state highway system, to CDOT, and then a portion to cities and counties. But 15% uh, of the general fund transfers go to a newly created multimodal transportation options fund. And of that transfer, 15% is allocated to state multimodal projects to be allocated by the, by the state's transportation commission. But 85% of those transfers are to be allocated to local multimodal transportation improvements around the state. And the bill also directs the transportation commission to establish a distribution formula for these um, for these the local project multimodal transportation funds, um, we it's directed that that distribution be based on a combination of population and transit ridership, um, and it's important to note that recipients of those funds are required to provide a minimum dollar for dollar match. We can, uh, the multimodal transportation option funds can be used for a variety of purposes, including capital or operating costs for fixed route and on-demand transit services, for transportation demand uh, management programs, for multimodal projects that are enabled by new technologies, uh, multimodal transportation studies, so think of large-scale corridor studies for future uh, multimodal projects, BRT projects and the like, and then bicycle and pedestrian improvements. So just to give you a sense of how this flows, again, uh, $495 million transfer from the general fund to the uh, transportation purposes in this fiscal year and another $150 million next fiscal year. 15% of those transfers to the multimodal transportation options funds, that would total $96 and three quarters million dollars over the two fiscal years. 85% of those funds are allocated for local multimodal transportation projects. Uh, that totals $82.24 million. And then finally, based on some uh, conversations with uh, the Colorado Department of Transportation, uh, particularly the Division of Transit and Rail, work that um, a number of advocacy groups and CDOT and DTR undertook uh, in developing a 10-year transit development program, we expect that the amount allocated by the Transportation Commission to the Dr. Cog region would be about 60% of the local multimodal options fund money. Uh, so that would be in the neighborhood of $50 million. So the question became, how should we start considering these funds uh, since we know from Senate Bill 1 that they, there will be these funds allocated out to transportation planning regions around the state, including the Dr. Cog region, um, that we will have the role of coordinating the allocation of those funds to local multimodal projects. How should we start considering those? And we um, assessed a range of options. After considering a number of options and talking through this uh, pretty extensively, uh, we developed a uh, recommendation uh, given that we have a TIP process now kicking off for, for uh, 2020 to 2023 to roll these anticipated funds into this upcoming TIP process um, following the previous board direction to split funds in this upcoming TIP process, 20% to the regional share and 80% to the sub-regional shares uh, for identification of uh, project recommendations that ultimately will come back to the board for action as part of the adoption of the 2020 to 23 TIP. 
Um, we reviewed the waiting list protocol from the existing uh, TIP process, the 2018 to 21 TIP. This is consistent with that waiting list protocol, and I'll get into that in a couple of slides. Um, we also believe that this offers an opportunity to potentially leverage some of these new state funds with some of the federal funds that we'll be allocating uh, through this TIP process, which I think given, again, that 50% match or that dollar for dollar match for these new multimodal option funds is advantageous to try to leverage uh, these, these sources of funds and maximize uh, how many projects can get funded. Um, it also creates a synergy with our other regional and sub-regional project um, submittals and the process that we'll undertake during this uh, development of the next TIP process. Um, really, the con for this process is, is it is admittedly a little messy uh, for a couple of reasons. Um, it, these new funds are state funds and come with some specific eligibilities that are a little different than the traditional uh, federal transportation funds that we typically allo that we allocate the surface transportation program metro funds, the congestion mitigation air quality funds, and the transportation alternatives funds. Um, so there are some differences in sort of the match requirements and the eligibilities that just make this a little bit, a little bit messy, admittedly. Um, just to show you a little bit graphically how this would work, and um, a good, this is a good time to remind you that we expect this allocation from the Transportation Commission uh, to happen sometime this fall, October, November, December timeframe. They've got a lot of work to develop sort of that distribution formula um, and actually allocate the funds out to the uh, MPOs around the state and the TPRs. But we expect that allocation to come to Dr. Cog, the entire Dr. Cog region, which, uh, as you will recall, includes both the MPO area, the urban area, as well as the non-MPO areas of Dr. Cog. So those non-MPO areas, Clear Creek County, Gilpin County, the eastern parts of Arapahoe and Adams County. Um, so those areas make up about 1% of the Dr. Cog region. So we propose with this to basically slice off 1% of the allocation that we would get from the commission. We'll run a separate call for just those areas for qualifying multimodal options fund projects and run that separately. The remaining 99% of the funds would then be rolled into the TIP process for 2023. Uh, again, 20% to the regional share, that would be uh, nearly $10 million, and then 80% to the sub-regional share for recommendations from each of the sub-regions for how to um, invest those dollars. That would be about uh, $39.6 million. Any questions on that before I talk about some of the other alternatives that we considered? Thank you, Ron. Since you just asked questions for what you presented, uh, under your uh, pros and cons, on the con, wouldn't that be the case of the three options you presented us to us? Wouldn't the con be the issue with all three of the options? I guess. Regardless? Mr. Chair, uh, Director, certainly I, I think you can make a little bit of an argument, and I'll, I can speak to speak to that issue particularly when I get into those alternatives. You don't mind, Lynn. Thank you, uh, Ron. Uh, what is the certainty that the that the TC will not act on this until after October first? My understanding is that CDOT got the funds from the state uh, July sixth. What is the reason for saying that this will go into the new uh, federal fiscal year? Thank you, Mr. Chair, Director Flynn. That's an excellent question. Um, so first of all, uh, there was a small clause written into Senate Bill 1 that makes the multimodal transportation options funds contingent on a supplemental appropriation by the legislature, which we don't actually expect to happen from the JBC, the Joint Budget Committee, until the end of September of this year. Uh, the second issue is that the commission is directed in Senate Bill 1 to consult with staff, the, statewide, the State Transportation Advisory Committee, uh, CASTA, other transit advocacy groups, bike pet advocacy groups, to develop the distribution formula, which my understanding is going to take some time for the commission to consider. And uh, from my conversations with CDOT staff, they don't expect all of that to be concluded and for the commission to actually take action on the allocation of those funds until 
well into the well into the late part of the fall. And I don't know if Deborah wants to add it. If I got that all correct, Deborah, but I, that's my understanding. Good job. Thank you. <laughs> Go ahead, Mr. Flynn. Does the uh, did the legislation authorize the JBC to that without going back to the legislature? Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, no, Director Flynn, it didn't. The, the legislation just specifically says that that allocation is subject to um, supplemental appropriation. JBC can't do that on its own. I'm curious, the legislature won't meet again until next year. Correct. That's no, not going to happen. Thank you uh, for the follow-up. My understanding is that the JBC will be, this will be presented to the JBC at their September meeting. I think it's September 21st and 22nd or 20th and 21st, something like that, to consider action on the supplemental appropriation. So is it possible then that we won't get the funds until 2020, or 2019 rather, well into 2020? Uh, Yes, Director Flynn, I, I think anything is possible when you send something to JBC. I think given the passage of Senate Bill Senate Bill 1 and the direction within Senate Bill 1 for these transfers, I think folks are large, fairly confident that it's a pro forma action and that that will occur. Respect. I have an easy question. Can you tell me one more time where the uh, 50 million, uh, what pot of money that comes from for Dr. Cog? Mr. Chair, uh, yeah, so the, the $50 million that we're anticipating, again, comes from the state general fund transfers that, direct, that are directed in Senate Bill 1. So those are state funds. Kowski. It'll take a full legislative action, even if it gets fast-tracked and still has to go to the governor and get signed. We're talking February at the earliest. Rocket. So thanks for that presentation. So the um, these would be uh, state funds, um, and of course TIP funds are federal funds. Could since they're different uh, buckets of money, could they be used to satisfy each other's match requirements? Mr. Chair, Director Brockett, uh, yes, that's correct. That's that's how we interpret. They can be used, and that that gets to one of the positives that we see of rolling these funds into this TIP call is that it allows some opportunity to leverage both of those funds since the state funds could be used to match uh, some of the federal funds. Federal funds could be used to help match, uh, meet some of the match requirements for the multimodal options fund. The other thing to consider also is that since these are state funds, if there are projects and a project sponsor has all of the required 50% match from non-federal funds for the multimodal options funds for a project, um, that that project then would not be federalized. Uh, just a thought, just to, if we take this option, I think we're going to need to think about exactly how we accept applications for projects, because normally, of course, we require a match. And so do we accept one project submission that has applies for both pots of money, you know, 50-50, for example? So the, that's something we'll need to think about. One of the things I would uh, advise the board is, Available is one word. Just because the legislature takes an action doesn't mean we have the money. So until that check hits Dr. Cog, that money is not technically available. We can't expend money we don't have in our pocket. As Mr. Flynn and some of the others have indicated, even that could add more time to this. Mr. Pfeiffer. So, so Ron, did... Um... This, this question that Aaron brought up is a little interesting because I thought for us to put our project forward, we'd have to, to score well. You'd have to have committed funds. So how could you commit for the tip call if you don't know what your state approval is on that? I mean, you're, if you lose the state money, you win the tip money or whatever, you've now obligated your community paying what you lost. I think it's very dangerous to go down that path for any community. Rocket. I could just add on to that, but would are we envisioning Dr. Cog being the granting agency for both sets of money? In in other words, that that we would grant both approvals. Which are, hold on, I'd like to debate that. And that's a question. Well, but I I look at that as you're assuming that one pot of money is automatically spoken for because this that went after this. I think that you're obligating one pot with the other. I, I think that would be unfair to assume that. 
Am I wrong? I, I said look to staff for direction on how we might be able to structure that, what the options might be. Mr. Mr. Chair, if I'm understanding the, the director's question, um, I think that there it provides the opportunity to, to look to op leveraging opportunities for both pots of funding. Um, I will say, though, generally, um, it's been our practice. We know sort of the different colors of money. We're used to dealing with different colors of money during a TIP process. CMAC and SDP Metro and, and transportation alternatives that have different eligibilities and different uses. Um, and so we're used to tracking those different colors of money. This adds a, a new color of money to the mix. Um, it does provide that leveraging opportunity, but largely we would be we would be looking for opportunities sort of as the projects are recommended on their merits to find opportunities to use the appropriate pot of funds to fund the appropriate set of projects. Um, so I I understand what, what uh, you're saying. I think the the I don't believe that the issue is whether the money will come. The question is when. It, and, which is similar, which is very similar. Remember that this is a four-year TIP process, and that's the same thing for the federal, for the out years of the federal funds. Those are also subject to federal appropriation, and we estimate and we calculate what we expect to to, to happen, and we program those funds over the course of the four. So years. if we make it part of this TIP call, right? If we make it part of it, so are are you saying that some communities can ask for both colors of money, while some communities may actually have their committed a green dollars I'm writing a check out of my community am I going to score differently on that tip project than somebody who's trying to go after state money and tip money is because that's not fair to bring that up now when we're going through this process just just pointing it out I mean if I'm putting saying I, I'm putting in a project a regional call or even a subregion and I have my 50% share and it's my cash in my bank how am I competing with the other projects that are saying, well, I don't have the cash, but I'll take the state money and try to go and use that as leveraging for my match to my federal money? You know what I'm saying? I, we just need to be a little careful where we're going because that's not fair to some of us communities that may not be going after the state money. Mm -hmm. So I'd be interested in what the scoring process would be. Thank you, Mr. Ch Mr. Chair. I, so we have talked about that in, in the context of the regional share. So remember that the regional share program requires at least a 50% match for any project funded with regional share funds, correct? Uh, which is the same match that's required for the multiple, multiple option funds. So for regional projects funded out of the regional share, you in fact could not use regional federal dollars to the TIP to leverage those, the, the regional share multimodal option funds because they, they, the, those projects out of the regional share require at least a 50% match. Um, so that's not an issue there. The projects will be scored and, and evaluated on their merits. Leverage will be a consideration, but it'll be leverage of those non-TIP funds. Um, on the, re the sub-regional share, the TIP policy draft that you'll be considering next requires at least a 20% non-TIP fund share. Which could be the state. I, I think that the policy says it's non-TIP fund. Um, match. Non-Dr. Cog allocated fund match of at least 20 percent. Bucket, you still had another question. Yeah, sorry to keep talking about this, but Ron, my, my original question was specifically about whether you could do a match from the federal funds to the state funds. And I had heard you say yes, but then you just said to Bob that no, you couldn't do that at the regional level. Mr. Chair, Director Brockett, perhaps I, I misunderstood your question or very possibly misspoke. I think I would use the word leverage the federal funds and the and the new state multimodal funds, not so much match, right? So there is still a minimum for the sub-regional share projects, a minimum 20% non-Dr. Cog allocated TIP fund match requirement for those funds, regardless of the source of those funds that are allocated through the TIP process. In the regional but you could one. leverage those funds and com combine those sources as long as the project has a non- TIP allocated funding source that equals at least 20% of the total So, so you would need that 50% additional match. You couldn't just, but uh, for the regional, right? And, and what you saying on the sub regional, I just need the 20%, but it's interesting that we can go for a project not knowing that we have the 20%. And you're supposed to be scored on the fact that you have committed funds. And so, how I still think there's a scoring issue here that we need to iron out first or making sure we're clear that 
if I'm not asking for the 20% to be state funds, shouldn't I have a better score because I'm not using the state funds? I'm using my own city funds? Probably so. But I, I, just, I just wish we, let's just consider thinking through this a little bit more um, because this is where I think we get into that whole uh, issue with us all arguing over things. And I think this is where I'd, I would probably weigh in saying it's not fair for a community that is willing to put their quote unquote green dollars in versus somebody who hasn't committed yet. Because we brought this up in the Adams County subregion about committed funds was supposed to be part of the scoring process. So. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, yeah, well, we said it was gonna be messy, yeah. right? Um, there's no doubt about it. I, and you know, these, these are some excellent questions. And you know, we, we've thrown around as many questions as we could in scenarios. And you know, I think the whole intent was that you know, we could expand the various pots, right, um, to allow more projects. And as a result, you could cobble together a project with different types of money. But I think the intent was always, at least it was staff's intent, that, um, that a local share would still be required, right? Whether that be the 50% match on the state funds or the 20% match on the federal funds. Anything else on that one? Maybe it would be helpful if I moved into the discussion of the alternatives the next and wrap this, wrap this up so you can have further conversation. So we, did, we considered a range of, of op options and, and alternatives as we were bouncing this around as staff. Uh, the two other alternatives that are, are feasible um, and our potential options were to fund eligible projects from the existing 2018 to 21 TIP waiting list um, with those anticipated uh, 2018 and 2019 multimodal transportation options funds um, and uh, for 18 and roll over the 19 funds into the 2023 TIP or alternative 1A would be to use all of these funds for the uh, waiting list projects and uh, this is what is important to consider is um, that the waiting list protocol that was included in your in your packet uh, specifically states that um, if monies become available prior to October 1 of 2018 so within the uh, federal fiscal year, this federal fiscal year uh, that ends October or September 30th of this year then those funds go to the waiting list funds that become available to Dr. Cog to allocate um, after se September 30th of 2018 are directed to roll into the next TIP cycle. And I think there's some rationale behind that. That was part of the TIP policy that you all adopted with that last, with that last TIP. But the rationale, I think, was largely that, you know, that, that project list starts to get a little stale after four years that, um, you know, there might be new opportunities or new priorities uh, that come up to consider um, it kind of when you get into that last year of an existing tip cycle. Um, <laughs> the other important thing to note from that protocol though is it is specific to the federal funds that we normally allocate in the tip process, the STP Metro funds, the CMAC funds, and the transportation alternative funds. And the protocol specifically calls out those specific funding categories uh, because that's what we're used to allocating in the tip. Um, and as a matter of fact, that's evidenced by the waiting list project that actually specifies the funding source for each of the projects on the waiting list, either CMAC funds or SDP funds. Uh, so that waiting list protocol never anticipated sort of a brand new type of money that Dr. Cog didn't typically allocate through the TIP process. Um, we did leave this as an option because it is, it is a viable option to consider uh, by RTC and, and the board. Um, but to actualize this alternative, this alternative would require going back and amending the existing TIP uh, to ch make that change the waiting list protocol to recognize uh, this new funding source and to change that TIP protocol uh, requirement that for money that becomes available after October 1st, that that money is rolled over into the next TIP. Um, it does obviously maximize the opportunity to fund currently prioritized eligible projects uh, that were identified in that last TIP process, does allow uh, for if, if the 2019 multimodal option funds were rolled over in the TIP, it does still allow some leveraging of some portion of those funds in this next TIP. Um, it, again, is not consistent with the waiting list protocol as currently adopted. Um, and the 2018 to 21 TIP waiting list is fairly old. 
about four years old since those projects were initially were originally um, submitted. Um, there was a very different process that was used to allocate those funds in that last TIP process under the eligibilities of SDP and CMAC that are slightly different than the multimodal transportation option funds that are created uh, with the general fund transfer from Senate Bill 1. Um, and so doesn't fully take into account sort of all the eligibility, the additional eligibilities that are included in the multimodal option funds. The second alternative we uh, very seriously considered was let's just treat these funds as a brand new set aside program, create a new Dr. Cog set aside program uh, for multimodal projects and basically run this as a separate call for projects after this next tip cycle is completed and we've selected projects through this, through this tip cycle. It is the cleanest of the options, quite admittedly. Um, it, we can craft that set aside program and the call for projects, the criteria and the evaluation of them very specifically to the specific eligibilities um, of the multimodal option funds. Again, it does miss a bit of an opportunity to potentially leverage um, and expand the pot of money and uh, fund more projects as part of the TIP process and consider all of the different projects being considered at the, both the regional level and the sub-regional allocation for the TIP process. But again, certainly a valid alternative to consider. With that, Mr. Chair, that concludes my presentation. I'd be happy to take any further questions or turn it over for discussion. Before I open up for questions, and I've, I've got three so far, the one about the treating it as a separate program, we discussed this at length yesterday at the RTC. We do not have the staff capacity to do one on top of another. I'll just tell you that now. We can't handle it staff-wise. And trying to be doing two different set-asides and two different sets of evaluation at the same time, we just can't handle it. Uh -huh. Now, we also have a recommendation from the RTC, which uh, Doug and Ron will uh, explain to you in a minute. And it, but if the board decision tonight is different than the RTC from yesterday, this goes back to the RTC. That's our policy. We have to have their concurrence, and both groups have to approve the same thing. Had uh, ooh, again, Mr. Flynn, you, Williams, Ms. Elrod. Okay, Mr. Flynn, if you would please. Thank you, uh, Ron. I'm not. I'm not sure that I'm persuaded yet, and maybe it's because I don't know enough about the waiting list protocol. I'm not persuaded that. That, that second option, the first option there on the other option screen, is actually inconsistent because it says when either uh, two million is accrued within one of the two specific categories, SDP, Metro, or CMAC, uh, TA, or B, an amount equal to 100% of the next in line top ranked project funding request is accrued. So I'm having trouble understanding that it's not consistent. I did talk to Director uh, to Doug this morning about it and uh, have a brief discussion on it. Uh, so I'm trying to understand why you're saying it's not consistent when it, from the plain wording, it, it seems to be. My my uh, worry is that with all the questions we've had so far, I don't believe that I'm ready to cast a knowledgeable vote. I don't have enough clarity as to whether it's possible yet that some of the money could come before October and fund some of these things that have been waiting, uh, waiting for their funding. I, I need to be more comfortable, uh, Mr. Chair. We have to we have to uh, pass something that's identical to uh, the RTC. Correct. Correct. We do. Do we have the option to postpone for one month, or do we have to vote yay or nay? Well, the board, I mean, the board always has that prerogative, okay. of course. So if we were to postpone, it doesn't have to go back. We consider this next month if we get more data and more input so I, I can have a knowledgeable vote. I don't know how, how every other director feels, but I know some of us had some pretty unclear thoughts even, on that. Even if you delay it, if you try to change what was approved to the RTC, you still end up going back to them, which it adds change. another month if right. it changes, right? Mr. Mr. Chair, I've got that. several of them. Too. Just... Mr. Flynn, is that, is that your only comment? Uh, I think you can clarify. Yeah. Go ahead, Ron. Sure, Mr. Chair, uh, Director Flynn. Uh, 
one our interpretation of the of the language of the waiting list protocol is that it speaks specifically to those federal categories of funds, the CMAC funds, the SDP Metro funds, and the TA funds. And again, we evidence that by the waiting the waiting list is very specific by project of which of those funding sources is allocated to those waiting list projects if those funding sources become available. The, the other point I did want to mention in terms of the delay, so, which again is certainly the board's prerogative, um, it will have a delay in the start of the next TIP cycle because that will delay the adoption of the TIP policy that guides this TIP process. So we were intending to open the regional share call for projects for this upcoming TIP cycle on July 30th. That will just, that will just bump and sort of delay the whole TIP process um, until we have an adopted TIP policy. Okay, but, but in my discussion with Doug this morning, it is possible that that could start even if we delay this. And was I was I correct? Mr. Chairman, if I may. Yeah, um, well, there are options, right? And, you know, there are ramifications to all the options, of course. I mean, sure. So, so one is a scenario in which we delay the call for projects, opening up the call. The other is a scenario in which, and this is just me just talking. I, I don't know. I'm sure Ron will correct me if I'm wrong. But um, we could open the call specific to the, um, the TIP policy minus this pot of money and then make a call on the run, right, basically after the next board meeting to make, to make a determination whether this money stays in that call or not. That would, in that case, as the chairman pointed out earlier, would require a, a different, we'd have to take it back through RTC because their recommendation on the TIP policy document was to roll the, the multimodal funds into the, 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 the policy and make that available. So, and we can do that too. We can have a special meeting of RTC in order to make deadlines and the like. Right. But um, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, anything's possible, but it, but it, it would probably delay something. Right, okay. Mr. Chair, my concern is that uh, um, literally the words don't, the, the words literally don't mean what, with all due respect to Ron, what, what he said. It says either uh, STP Metro CMAC uh, transportation alternatives or an amount equal to 100% of the next project, of the first project on the list, whichever category it came from. So being an old editor, that <laughs> still confuses me. And uh, I'll never get an argument with someone. If I, <laughs> if I, if so I, so I, you know, I would still, I, I still lean toward a postponement. It sort of feels like these projects have waited on this list for just this opportunity, and I hate to let it go uh, when, we st when we lack clarity. Uh, I used this uh, analogy with Doug this morning, and it seemed halfway persuasive for two minutes. But uh, then you it, talk for five, right? Oh, no, 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 no. But if anybody saw the movie uh, Office Space, anybody seen the movie Office Space? It feels like these projects are Milton when they passed out the cake, and he waited and he waited, and then the cake ran out, and he should have had that last piece of cake. So I hate to lose this opportunity. Uh, I'm not going to burn the building down, but. I hate to lose this opportunity if one month's delay won't uh, seriously damage the rest of the process. Just need to submit a TPS report. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Williams, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I certainly support uh, Director Flynn's comments here. I'd also like to um, express our concern with uh, mixing this level of state money into the TIP process. Um, I'm sure everyone is very selective on what types of projects they choose for federal, what types of projects they choose for state. Uh, and I would just like to see, I mean, as you have it up there, more a clean process specific to the statutory eligibility and match requirements. I guess that pro really weighs heavily with me. Uh, we're, we're adding a large amount of state funding process and really more concerned about kind of what precedent it's going to set for future ballot initiatives as we all know we've got a number of ballot initiatives coming down the uh, has there been any discussion on how uh, future state ballot initiative funding would be mr. chair director Williams uh, welcome um, in answer to your direct question um, it was expressed pretty clearly at the RTC that this does not set a precedent and because keep in mind that if the sales tax uh, revenue packet initiative passes in November, um, we could expect continuing allocations of 
multimodal transportation option funds to this region in the vicinity of $40 million a year. And we definitely did not want to and do not intend for this proposal, this action, if adopted, to set precedent for the allocation of those ongoing annual um, allocations of multimodal transportation options. In that case, I think we very fully in, would intend to then start to create a set-aside program for those funds and start to engage in a process. It was really a one-off for this immediate opportunity, uh, again, largely created because we're expecting these funds um, over the course of the next year or so and felt like it was important to consider uh, including them in this TIP process that we're beginning to engage in. Bill Rock. That working? Okay. Um, so coming back to the con here where it talks about the missed opportunity to leverage the federal TIP, again, I'm still trying to understand um, where we're landing on this match. Does this represent, this missed opportunity, is it a missed opportunity for the match or is it a missed opportunity that a project can leverage federal funds and state funds and be um, maybe a, a bigger project or encompass more things? Uh, Mr. Chair, Director Alrod, it, it, it is the latter. It is, it's, a, it's a missed, in our view at least, it's a missed opportunity to leverage the federal funds that are allocated through the TIP process and these new state uh, Senate Bill 1 multimodal option funds to either fund larger projects or even just expand the pot of money that's available to allocate through this TIP process and fund more projects. And I have no doubt, remember, that the regional share uh, program right now will have about $21 million to allocate to regional projects uh, across the entire uh, metropolitan planning organization area. Those dollars are not going to go very far. Um, and we will have many more projects submitted than we will be able to fund um, out of that regional share pot in this TIP cycle. Uh, the addition of $10 million helps expand that opportunity to construct more priority regional projects. So it, it, it's leverage and expanding the, the pool of funds available in the TIP process. And therefore, as a follow-up, do you um, potentially see where we may be submitting a project for the TIP and a separate project for the state because they have different requirements? Or do you see one project that may use both funds? All of the above. Director Arad, I, I think we've anticipated that, you know, we will, and from our interactions with all of the subregions and their conversations they've been having leading up to the first, the regional share call for projects, there has been a really good dialogue among the, the jurisdictions in those, in those subregional forums. And we fully anticipate to see a mix of projects. And certainly uh, the projects that we're aware of that are being considered by several of the subregions certainly fall into the eligibility of the new multimodal option funds. And so I, I personally, based on sort of our observations and our participation in the sub-regional forums and what's being considered, don't see an issue with having, uh, we'll, ha we'll see a variety of project types that could fit into the, the various eligibilities under the different funding programs. Ms. Smith. Ron, could you, could you go back to the slide that has the um, multimodal transportation options fund, multimodal projects defined in Senate Bill 1. Were all those types of projects eligible in the last call and could be on the waiting list? Uh, Mr. Chair, Director Smith, um, let's see. Uh, transit operate, transit capital certainly are eligible. Transit operating, I'd have to defer to someone that was here during Yeah, I, I can probably I, answer this. Transit operations was. Oh, um, was. Tran transportation demand management programs were not as part of the general call because we have a set aside for that. Um, multimodal mobility projects enabling new, enabled by new technology, I guess was allowed as part of it. I mean, I, we've never had any applications associated with. Um, multimodal transportation studies certainly were and bicycle pedestrian were. So the, the TDM projects were not. So my follow on is, so the first option that you provided besides the staff recommendation, you have something on here that is not allowed, maybe, I don't know if allowed is the right word, but wasn't allowed. And it seems to me that if the state legislature is saying 
these things are options, but then you have a program that says, nope, one of these is not an option. Is that valid? Or are you opening yourself up? Well, I will say, um, well, part of the, well, two things. Um, one, TDM uh, projects are eligible in this next call. Um, and we also clarified that actually um, at actually it was your advice to do so at the RTC yesterday that one table that's in the next agenda item that actually refers to the specific eligibility of uh, of the uh, multimodal funds so um, we don't perceive that as a problem this time but it certainly you know it was not eligible in the last call right and so that's my question if it wasn't eligible I'm wondering if you can actually go back to waiting list. That, that's my question and I was just trying to follow the logic there And it is true. I mean, as far as the technology goes, I mean, I, you know, technology means a lot of things right now. So in the last call, it is true that, um, you know, projects, Todd, correct me if I'm wrong, um, that like traffic operations projects or, or projects in which we have set-asides already established were not eligible in the last call. And Todd has given me a thumbs up, so. That's your question, Ms. Smith? Mr. Pfeiffer? So to continue the saga, before turning in the TPS report, he has to come and see the bobs. <laughs> <laughs> Anyone who's seen the movie, he'll catch on to it. Uh, so Mr. Chair, uh, I just wanted to clarify, when you said there's not enough room for uh, a parallel process or adding on, on this other option up here, the word set aside kind of throws me, but is I thought the thought around that one was we would do it after the sub-regional was completed, which would be next August 19, then would, is the idea of that option is then to open that up in August, September of 19 for another new call. Okay. So it's not really parallel. We, yeah, we, yes, we could definitely do that. Yeah, I think, I think what the chairman was stating was that, you know, we would be uncomfortable if we were running both calls at the same time. It's a staff resource issue for us, but it's also a staff resource for you all too, right? Because you guys will be putting together the, both the regional and sub-regional calls and the evaluation of projects and all that yourselves. So there's just a lot out there. So yes, I mean, this clearly is the cleanest and um, we can, we can, you know, start that process because it will take time to develop the criteria and all that as well. But we can start that process sometime next summer. Shit, there, DC. I caught some of this thinking process with it yesterday. But here's my thought on this. I'm really worried that this is our first time going to a sub region, first time going through all of this. We have our own training wheels to go through, and to muddy the waters with all of this confusion in the literally the beginning of a brand new process, even really in the nation, to start throwing curveballs into the process. So are we setting ourselves up for failure by trying to shove it in now? Or are we better off to just say, look, that was a curveball. Let's stay the course and go after this last option and just do it in parallel. Or not parallel, but in... I mean, staff wouldn't have any opposition to that. And we, we would not, I mean, the three options that we show up there, we feel that they're all viable options. We never would have shown them if we didn't think so. I don't think I'm worried about staff. I'm thinking I'm worried about us. Sure. You know? <laughs> <laughs> Let's be honest. Your words, not mine. <laughs> Ms. Walton, Ms. Elrod, I'll come back to you so they get through the others. Remind me what the process is of um, the existing waiting list. What happens to that list of projects? Mr. Mr. Chair, Director Walton, um, at the end of the TIP process, if new money hasn't become available per the waiting list protocol and been able to fund projects on the waiting list, then essentially that waiting list goes away at the end of that TIP. And is replaced with a new waiting list that's developed as part of the next TIP process, so in this case, the 2023 TIP process, which will also have a waiting list of projects at its conclusion. Would the option? 
dollars to fund the uh, Mr. Chair, if I'm understanding the question correctly, you're su I, uh, you're suggesting that. So your question is. If we go through this tip pro if we haven't rolled these funds into the into the sort of the allocation process for the for the tip process and we're only allocating the federal funds that we normally allocate through the tip process the SDP metro funds the CMAC funds and the transportation alternative funds we make a recommendation on which projects to fund and the remaining unfunded projects go on the waiting list in prioritized order then could we at a future date fund Potentially projects off of that new waiting list with the new multimodal option fund. Did I restate your question correctly? Um, I, I think that um, my initial reaction would be if we haven't included this new funding source in the TIP call uh, with the specific eligibilities for these new state funds integrated into the TIP process, I think I would, I, my initial reaction is I think I'd be. Um, reluctant to agree that we should then fund projects off of that TIP waiting list process. I think if the decision is not to roll these funds into the next TIP cycle, then the I think the second alternative that we're comfortable with is creating a new set-aside program and running a new call for projects specific to that funding source. Did I answer your question, Ms. Wong? Okay. I've got about five people in the queue, but right now I've got uh, Mr. Brockett and Ms. Stoltzman. Mr. Teal, and then Ms. Shaw. So just something I wanted to point out that one of the ways that the first option is messy is that if you, let, let's say your top scoring project um, were a, a road project, then it would get TIP funding because it wouldn't qualify for multimodal funding from the state. But if your top scoring project were a multimodal project, how would you decide whether it got the TIP funding or the multimodal funding? I mean, had you thought through that through yet, or uh, do we have an answer for that, or is it just something we'd have to figure out? Um, no, Mr. Mr. Chair, Director Brockett, no, I, I don't think it's something we have to figure out. We have given that some thought, um, and a couple of components. One is that um, even a roadway capacity project, if it has multimodal components to it, a bike lane, a uh, multi-use path associated with the project, other eligible pieces, components of the project, then multimodal option fund money could be a funding source for components of the project and we can mix those funding types. Um, I, in practice, what we've discussed is certainly looking at the mix of projects and I think there's some advantage to project sponsors if they have a fully qualifying project for the Senate Bill 1 multimodal option uh, funds that there would be an advantage to the project sponsor to not federalize that project if we could fully fund that project with the state funds. And so I think we'd be looking for opportunities and, uh, and work with the project sponsors to identify those projects that could be fully funded with the multiple options funds um, if there's an opportunity to avoid the federalization of that, of that locally sponsored project. Thanks for clarifying that. I do. I do still think it adds an element of messiness. I'll say. I'd say Director Pfeiffer's comments I've found pretty compelling. The one concern that I would have if we did separate them out completely would be, um, the, the, would we lose the ability to partially fund a multimodal project from the multimodal state multimodal funds? Like I'm thinking of projects that are fairly substantial in our region that we're trying to get funded that we're going to need a whole bunch of different sources for. And are we going to have to fill every last dollar bef before the state multimodal funds are available if we go with option number three? Uh, yes, sir. Uh, Director Brockett, um, so if the alternative were to run a separate call for projects just for the multimodal options funds projects, then I believe the answer to the question is yes. We would run this TIP process for the 2023 TIP as it's currently designed uh, with the federal funds, uh, decide on the projects to, to fund uh, in that TIP, and then we would do a call for projects specific to the state multimodal options funds uh, from Senate Bill 1, run that as a separate process, make project selections uh, with that funding, and then as, when that was completed, we would amend those projects into the TIP but they would be funded with only a combination of um, local non-multimodal options fund money and multimodal options fund money. I had to identify all of that funding in advance. 
That's but then correct. that gives me concern about taking option number three, the lack of the ability to leverage the funds as you take it. So I'm, things are seeming muddy here. Ms. Dalsman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So this is a multimodal transportation options fund from the state, and I think it's really important to hear from RTD on this. They're a big multimodal partner in our region. We get the train, we get the buses. Um, they're a huge partner for many of our jurisdictions in this region, uh, on this realm. And I'd like to point out that at RTC, the one no vote was from the Regional Transportation District, and I think that's of significant note. So. I don't see Mr. Van Meter here on they their are, behalf. There are no one here representing RTD tonight. Yeah, so I think that's pretty unfortunate um, to not be able to hear from RTD on this particular topic and have them weigh in. I think that's significant, and I think it's significant that they voted against this. Mr. Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple questions before I get to my points. Um, can, can I ask you to restate again, what is the required local match at the federal level for the federal TIP funds? You did, so you wouldn't pick up my topic. Um, uh, Mr. Chair, Director Teal, the minimum required non-federal match for federal funds is 20%. Did, did I hear a statement about what was required in terms of a local match for the Senate bill multimodal funds? And what, what was that amount? Um, Director Teal, the Senate bill one uh, directs that the minimum match for the multimodal options fund is 50%. A small asterisk is that the commission is given some latitude to reduce or modify that match requirement for small for small communities around the state. And I think that's largely directed at the very rural parts of the state, small transit agencies, small jurisdictions that may have difficult, that they anticipated could have difficulty coming up with a full dollar for dollar match. But the standard match requirement in Senate Bill 1 is dollar for dollar. Okay, thank you. I appreciate your caveat there. And I mean, I wanted to clarify that just, Bob, to kind of address some of your concern about somebody double dipping into both funds. I mean, if you're needing to access the state funds, you're already putting up a 50% local match. You have already passed that threshold for the 20% requirement for federal, if I understand where your concern came from. That's the root of it, is that you've already surpassed that. So I'm, I'd like to, and I, I love that we've gone through all the options, and uh, thank you to the gentleman from uh, Denver for getting us going and actually having a robust discussion. But I would like us to direct a little more attention back to that first option of just integrating this into our 80-20 split. It gives us $10 million additional to what is only a $20 million regional fund. So essentially providing nearly a third additional for us to use at a regional level. But at the local level, once we, well, there are two things. We had many in this room um, uh, putting forward very strong arguments when we talked about whether we were going to have Dr. Cog uh, support Senate Bill 1. And when we were going through some of those last amendments, there was a big, big discussion pertaining to the fact that we would have local um, um, set-asides coming out of Senate 1. Well, it just seems to me that it makes sense then that we do exercise that with option number one, if you will, as a part of that 80-20 split and allow the sub-regionals to have that piece of the puzzle so that we can actually spend that money locally. In addition, one of the impacts with spending that money locally came up, um, and actually, Ron, you just mentioned it just a moment ago, and I'd like to reiterate it, because it came up of course, it did come up in a meeting that you were in, in Douglas County, but it was pointed out by several staff members of what would be the threshold of funding um, in Douglas County. We only have 18 million right now under what we believe the, tips, the, the tip will be under an 80-20 split. And it was said several times when talking about ideas of what could come up that several of our uh, ideas offered by the elected officials, by the way, and then kind of shot down very politely by Douglas County staff and local municipality staff 
as I don't know if that's enough money to be worth federalizing the project. And Ron, you made that point that by going ahead and pushing this into the 80-20 split, as the RTC took action on, um, it does give us the opportunity to perhaps introduce more local projects at that sub-regional level, and perhaps at the regional level, under the idea that we won't need to federalize them. We could go for some of these smaller dollar um, projects that could still make a significant impact at a local level. Um, I'm sure we're going to want to talk about this some more, but that's my offering for option one that the RTC has already agreed with. Local, which I remember the conversation properly that happened in the other room, not in this room, but among this board, that was the intent. Sure. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I would like to speak for option one as well. Um, by making comments about the other options. I, it seems to me that if you have something that is currently on the waiting list for uh, 18 to 21 that is still viable, that is still of interest to you, that you could put it forward again in the new tip cycle, the new request or call for projects, um, and that takes care of some of the concern that that some of us, including myself, have about um, aging projects, things that really need to be modified in any case. So, um, and my other concern with going with uh, option three is that we would delay the use of this money further. Um, because we would be waiting for the ability for staff to uh, take this on and handle it. So truly, I feel like the accounting we need to get comfortable with, but I think it is simply a matter of accounting for the money. And if we can get past that concern about accounting, that option one seems to be the fairest option to me, most effective. Thank you. Ms. Christman. Oh, okay. Um, first, I'd like to speak to uh, delaying the decision on this. I think that that would be a mistake. I, I think we've all read the materials, and I think we should vote on it um, because we do need to move forward on this very quickly. I think delaying it um, does not gain a lot um, for any of us. The second thing is um, I do not think, honestly, it's that the third option is truly cleaner. I think it makes the region and sub-regional projects decision-making harder because you're going to have to gamble with what you're deciding as to what you should hold out, what you should try to leverage, because maybe you could get it later. And I think that makes for inefficient and poor decision making. And that's all I have to say. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just wanted to say I uh, concur with the comments from Director Teal and Director Shaw. I think as a smaller community, I think we would be uh, kind of disenfranchised by just defaulting to the old list. I, we've gone through a lot of change in our community. The project we have on the list is not our highest priority any longer. It's still something we're interested in, but it's not what we would consider submitting. I, I appreciate we're going through some new processes, but I, I agree that there's nothing that seems like would prohibit someone from resubmitting the project that's on the waiting list if their subregion agreed that that's still a priority for the area. Um, you know, I, I think there's some economies of scale, even though it does maybe throw some new twists to what we're already dealing with. But based on our discussions in our subregion, I feel comfortable that we could probably manage through that. Uh, so I'd, I'd like to see us use the option that helps us leverage the funding the best. I have comments from anyone else that hasn't had an opportunity. All right, Ms. Elrod, if you would, please. 
So I won't repeat what the last um, three directors commented on because I had those as well. But I'm going to add two more um, in support of going to the first option that was presented to us tonight. Uh, one of the things that, and one of the reasons, you know, we did get this money is we know that growth is happening in our state, but our infrastructure is not able to keep up with it. And so we are already trying to catch up. And so to further delay, that just takes a lot. Um, it means we have to run even faster when we get there. And obviously, time is money. So the money that's available now is going to have less value to us a year from now. So two important considerations there. And then there was a comment around, um, we are in a new process, and I understand that we are stumbling, you know, potentially we are stumbling upon that, or stumbling through that. And as a new um, director, I actually feel that if we were to navigate between one process and another process, as you also said, that actually adds more complexity. Um, and, you know, I, I'm a little bit, it's a little unsettling, um, to be quite honest, to, to say that we're not ready for this new process because we're taking on um, some pretty substantial um, initiatives and actions in this new process. So I do think um, we are ready to figure it out. Other comments from any member of the authority? Pfeiffer, one more time. The limit? I, I paid. Yes. I put my quarters in. So I, I don't think it's, you know, it's it's a new process. I get that. I I, I think that there is, depending on which region, it have different troubles. And so um, I just want to make sure that the overall seven-county region is successful. Um, and then, you know, we're all working down our lists right now. This adds a different layer of a list that some regions are not looking at. And so that's not fair to those regions who didn't know this was something that was happening. And now it's all of a sudden here, and the call is going to go out when? Three weeks? Two weeks? We've been working on this since May 1st. So just keep that in mind. I think we've all been there. But I want to go through uh, Director Teal's scenario. I, I need to be educated on how this will play out just so I can understand the color of money. Can you help me through his scenario where uh, the match exceeds the local. So there's two things. Regional matches are 50%, right? So it's a, it's a dollar for dollar. So, But we're going to have some money in that, right? So really, you're going to decide where it kind of comes out of based on the project anyways, because that one I think is a null and void. doesn't matter. It's not debatable. I think the other the sub-region is where we start getting into questions. I don't know, Doug looks like Doug wants to answer. Yeah, let me take a shot at it. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I think it is a very good question. I appreciate you asking because I was going to actually comment on this. So, if option one is chosen, um, the regional share portion of that is pretty clean, right? I mean, that's the cleanest by far because each match is fifty-fifty. Um, so we can. It's just it's a color of money thing. We can blend projects. That won't be an issue. I can guarantee it. Um, simply because we'll have a lot more projects submitted than what we can. Other than regions, sub-regions that have not prepared to submit something that might fall into that bucket of money. Well, but you only get three projects you can submit anyway, right? And I would suggest even most, a lot of the capacity projects would have elements that would be eligible, okay. right? For the most part. Um, it gets a little more messy. We've used that word quite a bit tonight on, on the sub-regional side. Now, I will say on the sub-regional side that you will know how much money, how much of the multimodal fund money you will have. You'll, you'll know how much of each pot of money each sub-region will have. That would be STP, CMAC, TA, Transportation Alternatives, and multimodal fund. You'll know how much. So, and a result of that, remember the... the what the, um, the process will be, the sub-regional forum will recommend a package of projects that fits the criteria of those four pots. So with an understanding that you will need more match for one of those, two pot, one of those four pots um, that you ultimately present. Um, and it's, it's messy. Well, so the, the question or earlier debate was around using leveraging the dollars as match. And what you're just explaining is, no, not necessarily. You're just going to put it into one of the four buckets. You can't use the state match. You technically probably wouldn't use the state match for the TIP federal funds. 
Well, I mean, in a subregion. That's and, what I'm trying to get to. Ron, I don't want to. I want to speak over you on this, but I mean, I, I think you know we've had some discussions about this, and I think it, the idea was really to expand the pot. The word leverage is probably not the best word. Um, you know, so so, it just adds into our pot, and we can use that. It's not that I can take the state funds and put it onto a tip. Correct. Yeah, I think the the at least the intent of staff when we talked about it. Am I right? The battery. <laughs> Make sure the mic's on when you say that. Where's the microphone right here? Grab this mic. Right. Yeah, it's definitely working. So, um, I, our sense was that leverage was not a bad word to use because you could in fact combine the different sources of funds to fund a larger project and that, which is why I think probably leverage is a better word than using one fund to match the other but the ability to leverage funds and combine the funds to fund a potentially larger project was potentially an advantage finding them together so the intent was necessarily say, well, I'm going to take the state funds and use that as my match to my tip funds. Correct. That wasn't the intent of that word. Because I, I think you were saying that, you know, if, if the locals don't put in their match money, it, it, you know, you might not have the buy-in or the, the support. So I just needed to get to you. it. What are you two high-fiving over there for? <laughs> oh. I just need to work through it so I understood because this is a lot of questions in one of our subregions that gets into committed money and how it works and and that's how we're voting uh, on which projects to put forth is based on committed funds and how do we define define that so thank you Rukowski call the question I don't have a motion at this point call a question on call the question I understand I've had a request for a motion to call the question would essentially shut down debate. I still have about five people in the queue that have not spoken. Some have not spoken, some have spoken once already. So the question is, do I have a second to call the question? I have a second. I have a motion and a second to call the question. All in favor of Ending debate or discussion, please raise your hand so I can see. Okay. In favor of uh, that is 13. How many are in opposition to ending debate? Them up, please. Don't take motion fails on a 13 to 18 vote. Let me go back to pick up where we left off, and I'll still try to make sure we get plenty of discussion in here. Right now, uh, I have Miss Stoltzman, Mr. Brockett, and then Mr. Teal. Thank you. I just wanted to talk about the match and the leverage. Miss somebody, hold your hand up because I'm trying to watch for it. Okay, but I got you. So in the Boulder County Subregional Forum, in the submission of the regional projects, there's been discussion in ours about committing our subregional funds to support the match of the regional pro projects. <laughs> the, the witching hour has started. The lights will be going out next. Yep. That's pretty funny. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I was just waiting. You don't, you don't need to slide deck to, to have so, conversation. So as I understand from the Dr. Cog staff, if the group votes and will commit to that, using that source of funding, that can serve as a match. So I do think it's like your previous assumption, which is not what was said to you a minute ago. So... Yeah, so we've been told... So people have... It, we, uh, we're voting on it at the next subregional meeting. It's not been voted on or committed to by our group. You're using but federal like, funds to match federal funds? Yeah, that's, hang, hang on. Let's don't have two conversations between each other. Make your comments, and then we'll deal with them. 
So would you repeat it because we lost a lot of it with the screen sure. going up and down? So the, dis the discussion has been, would we use our sub-regional funding to match our regional project as part of the match? And we've been told that that's an acceptable thing to do if you commit it ahead of time. And so, for example, if you had these state funds, you would be using state funds from your sub-regional to match the regional if you got the sub-region to commit to it ahead of time. So our understanding to this point, we've not voted on whether we want to do this. I'm not suggesting whether this is a good or a bad idea or what my personal opinion is on it, but we've been told that that is acceptable. Mr. Popstorf, would you respond, please? Sure, uh, maybe. Mr. Chair, Director Smallsman. Uh, yes, and so to clarify, there, there, there is a little bit of a mixing of apples and or oranges happening in those. So we have been approached by several sub-regional forums about the leveraging of the regional share funds with potentially a portion of the sub-regional uh, share that would be recommended for funding through the sub-regional forum. Um, our direction, our response has been that, remember, the TIP policy requires a 50% non-regional non share funding for regional share funded projects. The federal, the minimum federal match requirement, and I think this, we're, we've probably been throwing around the word match a little bit too loosely. The, re, the minimum required federal match for federal transportation dollars is 20% non-federal funds. So our direction has been, or our response to the question from some subregions has been that if there is an important regional project uh, that maybe a couple of subregions want to participate in and is a priority for regional share and it is successful through the regional process that those subregions could consider allocating or recommending allocating a portion of their subregional share to that same project to put together a funding package as long as there was no more than 50% of the regional share allocated money going to the project and no more than 80% of the total project cost using federal funds. I, was it, did that, Mr. Olson, was that, I hope that clarifies that issue. Yeah, I, I'm not confused. I was just clarifying previous statements because I think it was misleading to answer some of Director Pfeiffer's questions if I understood what you were asking. And so I was just trying to throw that in so you'd have an additional piece of information. All right, let's go. Mr. Brockett. So I'll just say the, the ability to combine the different funding pots into one project for me is compelling for option one. I appreciate Director Rakowski's attempt to move us forward. If it pleases the chair, I would put a motion on the table. Well, I'd like to let those who haven't spoken first have Absolutely. an opportunity before we take and, a motion. And no, no intent to close the discussion, but was interested in maybe offering a basis for further. And when it's time to make it, I'll come back to you if you don't mind. Very good. All right. Mr. Starker. You have not had a chance to speak tonight, then I'll come back to Mr. Teal. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I wanted to go back to something early in the discussion, and that was when did the funds become available on SB001? Mr. Chair, Mr. Director, um, again, the legislation specifies that the general, funds the general fund transfers occur in split between fiscal year 18, this current fiscal year that began July 1, and fiscal year 19 that began July 1 of 2019. Um, our read of available has historically been when it is available to Dr. Cog to actually allocate um, and becomes available to, to Dr. Cog to actually um, allocate out in a call for projects. Again, our read of that is when the Transportation Commission actually makes a decision on a distribution formula and allocates those funds to the transportation planning regions around the state, including Dr. Cog, which again, we anticipate to happen regardless of when the legislature does the supplemental um, appropriation and when the transfer kind of general fund within the treasury happens, um, it's, they become available to us once the commission has actually taken action to allocate the funds and develop the distribution formula. And, and if, I, if I recall some other correspondence I had, we've accelerated the call for regional projects into, into August. Is that? Uh, director, right. um, we anticipate beginning the call for projects for the regional share in this upcoming tip cycle at the end of July to begin that process. That'll be an eight-week 
call that'll be open so applications can come into Dr. Cog anytime during that eight week period and then there will be a review and a selection process that follows that. So, so from a timing standpoint, you expect, you expect these funds to be available for that call? Um, Mr. Director, to, to follow up, um, you know, we do, we do a four-year TIP process. So this is the, this is the federal fiscal years 2020 to 2023. Um, really, all of the funds that we're allocating during the TIP process are anticipated funds, just like these Senate Bill 1 uh, general fund transfer monies are anticipated funds. We have a pretty good estimate. We have a pretty good sense of what the amount will be, at, is, which is the same case for the federal funds that we allocate. Thank you. Mr. Teal. Thank you, Chair. Um, I'd like to concur with Mr. Brockett. Um, I, I think it's the, there's an ad advantage to be had with option one in that, you know, funding will, of course, involve local funds. But there is that opportunity to have that combination of the state funding as well as the federal that could help to bring a process over the line. I'd like us all, those of us that were here in the last TIP process, that became an issue many times in our discussions of we just need this much and it'll bring it over the line and we get the entire project done as opposed to comparing it to another project. So I think there's real advantage in option number one as Mr. Brockett pointed out. And then secondly, would the chairman entertain a motion at this time? Uh, as soon as I know that I have no one else that has not spoken, has attacked, I'm going to come back to Mr. Brockett so that he had asked to make the motion. So I'll just check one more time. Ms. Smith, Mr. Flynn, I'll come to you. For and fear then, of being stoned, I have a question. <laughs> <laughs> so what's the max project size allowed under the TIP process? Uh, Mr. Chair, Director Smith, the maximum size under the draft tip policy that you'll consider for the regional share is twenty million dollars uh, for the region for regional for share. Regional. So uh, we don't have we didn't establish a maximum for the sub regional share. So so my point is for the regional you still can't ask for more than that even though you're getting these additional funds. I just wanted to be clear and bring that up for everyone. All right, Mr. Flynn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Just briefly, I want to thank all the members for the discussion it's brought it's helped me a lot I'm still at, in a place where I don't have enough clarity that I will probably vote no for the reasons that Nick I and others have expressed uh, here already but I do appreciate the staff work on it the one thing that feels very awkward that I just want to comment on before the motion is made is as a decision maker here at this level it feels very awkward to feel like we only have the choice of voting option one or nothing else, because if we postpone, we cause downstream damage if, uh, to the process. If we vote it down, it goes back to RTC, and it's very awkward to sit here and feel like your only choice is to vote yes. And so uh, I just wanted to point that out. I don't know if, if it had been possible to bring these matters earlier, where we're not backed into a corner, uh, and, and, and have the opportunity to get more clarity with a one-month postponement. Uh, in the future, that might that'd be really helpful to some of us. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Mr. Pfeiffer. Thank you for the pleasure. Uh, just clarity on uh, the, I want to make sure that each subregion is getting the same information to make the same decision because I'm starting to fill in here that we're making a change here and other subregions have different information than what we've gotten two of my region subregions. So that that discussion around uh, federal money and using your subregional sub money to use for your regional match and committing uh, on sub subregion that hasn't been discussed in the subregion yet. A little weird to me. But secondly, um, there is something I thought in that said that you had to have committed money. When you submit to this regional pot, you have to have committed money. That means real. The subregion's not there yet. So I don't get how somebody can write a check in the future and be okay with putting it on as a committed dollars. Let's just, I'm still stuck around, do you have the money in the bank to do the project or not? Why I say this is because how many times do we have a project come back to the board, it was delayed because they didn't have the money. So let's not go down that rabbit hole again because that is a policy of ours that we wait two years and all of a sudden they say, ah, well, we didn't have the money. But meanwhile, all your communities got screwed in some way when you could have probably been the next one to do a project. So I want to keep 
putting back on this committed match, it's got to be there. And it's part of the scoring, my understanding. At least at our subregion, I asked, if you have money in the bank, I should have a higher score than somebody who's saying, well, I'm going to move that money from over here. That's kind of a future check. I might move it here. They should get a lower score than us, right? So I, we're, I'm okay with number one if we go that way, but I also want to make sure the rules we're playing with is the next discussions around the tip policy that we're all on the same page because I don't think we are. Mr. Chair, is that a question from Greg? Question. Or a <laughs> statement. It's statement. a statement more than anything. Ms. Henry. We've all talked this to death. I appreciate everybody's comments and concerns, but it's getting late and we have more on our agenda to get to, so I would really like to see us move forward. But on the concerns of making sure the subregions all have the same information, we all should have staff here to get that information all at the same time. And we also have staff at Dr. Cog. So I don't think we need to be concerned. And if we are concerned, then you need to get a new staff. Um, just saying. I'm not concerned about Adams County. We have the information. So with that said, I would really like us to move forward. Okay. All right. I'm going to ask one last time. Has anyone else got any comments? Because otherwise, I'm turning it to Mr. Brockett. Being no hands, Mr. Brockett, if you would entertain a motion. Absolutely. Just one quick comment. I do. Uh, there. No, 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 no. <laughs> Here. If you'll hear me out, I think it's actually helpful, which is that I'm, I'm just continued to perceive a, a lack of clarity in terms of how the colors of money work together. So with that in mind, my motion is that we accept staff's recommendation on how to disperse the SB1 money with the added request that they put together a detailed itemization of exactly how you can combine the different colors of money in your calls for project. I have a motion and a second, as I understand the motion and the request in the motion. That is not significantly different from what the RTC recommended. So we are still on tight. If, the, if this motion passes, then that would take care of that problem. We will not have to go back to the RTC. If it fails, we will have to go back to the RTC unless a second motion is brought forward that changes it in some other form. So because we understand that there are people who are not all in agreement, the motion's been made and seconded. All those in favor of the motion, and Connie is the rule keeper of the hands being up so we can count them. If you're in favor of the motion as presented by Mr. Brockett and seconded by Mr. Teal, please raise your hand. Those opposed? Motion passes on a 30 to 4 vote. Now we can move on to the next item. The trail. All the questions. <laughs> 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 this one could actually be cheaper there we go there we go so um first i want to just clarify the information that is contained down in your contained that's within your packet um so attachment one is the action draft um dated july 17th of the uh tip policy Within the TIP policy document, um, it contains um, uh, it contains uh, track changes version of the recommendation that you had just made uh, regarding the last item. Um, this is also the same that the TAC and the RTC took. So again, those are that's contained within track changes. Uh, there's one additional change that the RT, RTC did make, and that's contained at your at your table. Um, it is. Labeled on the top is revised table three of the tip action draft. So this was a change to page 16 within your attachment that's contained within attachment E, uh, attachment one. Um, and it's a change to table three that just uh, further explains project categories that are eligible for the regional share funding um, now that the multimodal um, options fund is contained within the funding options. 
Um, in addition to the attachments that are contained, uh, attachment two are our comments in the city and county of Denver, CDOT, and Federal Highway. All of those changes have been incorporated into this action draft in attachment one. Uh, and finally, this is the staff presentation. So I will just very briefly, sorry, getting a lot of feedback. Uh, so again, this is a very similar presentation to what you saw last month, very condensed, um, very condensed. <laughs> but uh, again, this has been a uh, approximate three year process through not only yourself, through your technical members, um, all through, also through TIP policy work group, um, ultimately coming to this dual model process. Um, it contains three major elements, um, set asides, which is very similar to what you've seen before, um, and splits the calls for projects into the regional share and the sub-regional share. For the set-asides, just a couple notable changes. Um, we have increased the amount to $49.4 million in funds over the total of four years, and the addition of a human service uh, transportation set-aside. That is a new set-aside for this tip cycle. Um, just quickly running through the, an outline of the actual document. Uh, of course, the section one is just the introduction and um, explains more of the purpose and the relationship between MetroVision and the MetroVision Regional Transportation Plan. Uh, section two outlines the agency roles and requirements. So it, it outlines um, the roles that CDOT and RTD take along with Dr. Cog in the development of this entire TIP document, not only the calls for projects. It also outlines the eligibility requirements for all projects that are contained in the TIP not only the ones that Dr. Cog selects through its calls for projects. Uh, section three outlines the steps that Dr. Cog takes before the calls for projects are issued. Um, that, you know, staff will go through in a funding assessment and do that initial program of any carryover projects, set aside programs, and any of the other commitments that are contained within the document. Uh, section four outlines the, both the calls for projects. It also outlines any eligibility requirements for any project that is um, selected with Dr. Cog funds. Uh, section five out, outlines what happens, outlines what happens, I'm picking the wrong direction, outlines what happens next. So it outlines what happens when the calls for projects are complete. You know, Dr. Cog will continue to develop that um, document. Um, it will take us through the adoption of those of this document. And finally explain what happens when, after the, the document is adopted, how revisions are, are handled and also if there's any funding changes that take place. Uh, of course, there's four different appendixes that outline um, different aspects, including the selection processes by RTD and CDOT, eligible projects by, by all the funding sources, um, the eligible roadway and transit capacity projects, in addition to the regional share criteria. Um, so as previously mentioned, assuming we have an adoption here of this document shortly, the call will open on July 30th and close eight weeks later on September 21st. Uh, once we convene, uh, Dr. Cog scores the projects for the regional share, um, goes through the project review panel, um, we can hopefully conclude in January of 2019 um, with a uh, recommendation by this board to put the draft regional share projects into the TIP. Um, we'll have a very similar process for the sub-regional call for projects, um, which will hopefully take us no later than June. Um, with that working process, we would look for uh, adoption of the, of the 2023 TIP document um, next August. Um, with that, I'll take any comments or questions you may have. Let me point out for the uh, group, the RTC changes that were made were approved on a unanimous vote with those changes which were presented to you tonight. Those changes, therefore, bring a positive uh, motion from the RTC to accept it as it is now written. Any comments or questions for Mr. Cottrell? Seeing none, I would entertain a motion to accept it. Lynn, I have a motion and I have a second from Mr. Rakowski. Any other comments or questions? All those in favor, please signify by aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? Hearing none, the motion is carried. Mr. Calvert.
Oh. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Let me get this up real quick. Uh, there it is. Uh, so thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, Brad Calvert, I'm the Director of the Regional Planning and Development Division here at, at Dr. Cog. Uh, Doug mentioned uh, a little bit about this item in his report, so I'll, and because we're behind schedule, I'll be very brief and try to hit really the highlights. Um, I want to sort of brief you on um, one of our newest initiatives, um, which as Doug mentioned is actually not new to the region at all. Um, it is something that's uh, called the Citizens Academy, and I, and I really just, I want you to know how important you are to us in both the referral, recruitment, and filling this class with, with emerging leaders around the region. That is the big ask that I want uh, to put in front of you tonight. Um, as was mentioned uh, during the executive director report, uh, we actually are taking over this initiative in this program. This was formerly um, a program of a group called the Transit Alliance. Uh, the Transit Alliance formed um, in the late 90s after a failed uh, tran uh, referendum on, on, on transit infrastructure um, and, and ultimately, when Fast Tracks was passed back in 2004, they sort of went through a process to understand, well, now what? What do we do as a region to make sure that we actually take advantage uh, of this resource that the voters um, voted to approve? And one of the things that came out of that conversation with real estate uh, professionals, um, the business community, environmental uh, groups was, well, we need to have a, conver a place where emerging leaders can get together and talk about the future of the region through the lens of the infrastructure investments this region is making in the communities that are being built uh, around that infrastructure. So for the past 10 years um, or more, uh, that is really what the Citizens Academy has been about. And as you can see on the slide, uh, fast forward um, 10 years worth of, of uh, Citizens Academies, over 800 alumni have gone through that program. Um, and so we are, as, as Doug mentioned, I think he used the word privilege. We're very privileged that we were asked to think about how Dr. Cog could ultimately uh, pick up and run with uh, this really successful uh, program. Uh, so uh, Citizens Academy, uh, Transit Alliance was ultimately thinking through um, sort of how they might dissolve as an organization and in that conversation, they reached out to us um, to, to see if we would be interested in taking up um, the program. Uh, we did a fair amount of due diligence on this. Um, ultimately, we, we, we arrived at the, at the conclusion that yes, um, it really was a, a successful program. It's in the best interest of the, of the region uh, to continue uh, the great work the Transit Alliance um, had done for more than a decade um, and executed a transfer agreement and ultimately are hosting the first Citizens Academy here in this room um, as Dr. Cog uh, and starting in September. Uh, and I think that was mentioned in the, in the flyer that's um, on your, uh, at your place. Uh, we actually had some very real considerations and conversations as staff about trying to have a spring academy. Transit Alliance had historically had a fall and a spring academy, and we just realized we would be rushed and we wouldn't get it right. We were in the middle of an office move that we're still obviously experiencing some growing pains for, so we were a little nervous about being able to do it right um, last spring. Um, and the other thing that's important to us that maybe, um, for, particularly for alumni of, of the academy, we understand that this is a successful model and we're going to do our best to change as little as possible. If, if we know it's working, um, why make uh, changes to that to that uh, to that model. As I just wanted to mention this as part of our due diligence. Um, one of the things that we looked into was how uh, how the academy ultimately sort of lines up with some of our uh, balanced scorecard balanced scorecard objectives. Um, we've been working on balanced scorecards since 2014, and periodically the the, the board hears um, updates on how we're doing um, with that performance management approach and. This particular initiative ticked off at least four what we call tier one objectives um, for the organization, promoting an informed decision, maximizing value to our communities, uh, providing quality products and services, and enhancing strategic partnerships. So we saw a very real nexus between what organizationally we've talked about is important and how this initiative can ultimately help us uh, deliver on that. So a little bit about what, uh, what is the Citizens Academy. Uh, Doug also used the term commitment in his uh, uh, executive director report, and I think that's a very real uh, description. Seven weeks straight, three hours, six to nine p.m. You've got to want to do this uh, to, to ultimately uh, apply, sign up, and participate, because the expectation is that you, as a participant, you're gonna be there all seven weeks. Uh, the learning model really is built around uh, both lectures, uh, sort of group discussion. Um, we even build in uh, tours. Uh, to the program um, and, and really working together um, across sectors for uh, citizens and residents to learn from each other and figure out how they can become more uh, civically engaged um, going forward. Um, I know when I think of, and you probably think the same way, when you think of 
seven weeks of, of lectures for almost three hours, it probably scares you, but it's actually one of the more effective sort of learning techniques um, over the decade of, this, of the academy, because we are oftentimes having residents connect with people that otherwise they would not really connect with in their day-to-day -day life, right? So having someone talk about an initiative that maybe is something you're very familiar with, there are a lot of residents that simply are not gonna be familiar with that, and so it is, it is something that, that folks really um, do uh, appreciate as part of, part of the course. Uh, one of the main reasons why we were very much drawn to continuing uh, this program is that it had a demonstrated track record of success. Um, and so it really has targeted and benefited emerging leaders uh, in our region. Uh, the chart on the left-hand slide just sort of shows the types, the age uh, diversification um, associated with the applicants. They actually do tend to skew a little younger, though we actually hit a lot, um, a pretty diverse set of age groups. So we are, we are able to hit, and the history of the academy is hitting people that are in the beginnings of their role of understanding how they can be engaged in their community, and this can shape both their professional and personal interests for, for, for decades to come. And on the right-hand side, side of the slide, you can see that ultimately this academy has produced folks um, throughout kind of the, the, the rungs of the ladder of, of engagement and decision-making. Uh, 26 folks sort of signed up for the enviable task of being an elected official, whether that is local or at the state level, hundreds in the sort of appointed position, serving on neighborhood organizations, uh, nonprofit boards, all that sort of stuff. So people go through it, learn about regional issues, and ultimately decide uh, to stay committed. So the ask, this is the ask that I really want to make from you, and Doug sort of hit, hit this. Um, this is an idea of where applicants have come from over the last decade. We will do a big, huge promotional push. We will flood your email inbox. We will, we will flood all in, all, every inbox that we can get to. The reality is over half of the applications come from referrals or word of mouth. And so Doug mentioned this, and I would just encourage you, you are likely going to get an email from, from Connie or me around uh, August 1st that, that announces this opportunity. Please, as Doug said, just think about uh, folks in your community that really would benefit from this conversation, emerging leaders that are simply trying to figure out how to be engaged in their, in their community. And the other um, uh, opportunity that I would mention is this has been a really successful program for local government staff. Um, there are a lot of folks on your, um, on your teams that are emerging leaders that are trying to understand kind of the broader set of context uh, that impact uh, the work that they um, do each and every day. I've had, I've, I have presented um, to the Citizens Academy pretty much every year that I've been here at Dr. Cog, and you will be surprised, the traffic engineer that's in that group, how much they get out of this conversation because they have a very narrow focus at work, and this is the opportunity to expand kind of what they understand in terms of regional challenges and opportunities to connect uh, with other folks around the region. Uh, so just some key dates uh, for you to keep in mind. As I mentioned, you are going to get something in your email, I would guess, on or around August 1st. Please, just in the, in the time between now and then, uh, be thinking about both um, uh, residents and potentially even staff within your organizations that this might be um, a, a good uh, program for. Uh, the application will be open for about five weeks. And then as Doug mentioned, and it's again on the slide, um, the Academy will begin on September 27th. Uh, so every Thursday, six to nine in this room, we'll be working for seven weeks um, with, with those emerging leaders. Uh, I am a little curious how a Thursday evening is going to work. Um, when Transit Alliance um, was running this, they actually used Wednesday evenings, which you can imagine is difficult uh, for Dr. Cog's staff to actually be able to accommodate. So I'm a little interested how that transition uh, is going to work. And then, as I mentioned, seven straight weeks. A few things that we're working on um, in the interim, there is actually a website right now, a, a piece of the Dr. Cog website that describes uh, the Citizens Academy. It's on the, um, the, fl the flyer that's, that, that's your place, and I also have some extra flyers if you need it. Um, but we're building out the application and the other sort of um, affiliated documents that will go uh, with the application process, and we're actually trying to finalize uh, curriculum as well. You hear 21 hours of learning time, and you think that's all the time in the world. It is not. <laughs> I think two Fridays ago, I, I thought about every single idea we had pitched over the last six weeks, and getting to 21 hours was, was very difficult. Um, so that's hard for the fall, but it actually gives me a whole, a whole lot of comfort that we will have no issue filling this time for the spring and, and, and the next fall. And there's no shortage of issues that will come up in this um, forum that obviously are actually really good conversations for uh, folks that are participating in the Citizens Academy as well. So a lot of the conversations that you have will ultimately in some way find their way, at least from a topic-based uh, 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 sort of context, 
into uh, the curriculum for the Citizen Academy uh, as well. With that, I'm happy to take questions, um, comments. I know that we actually have uh, both current and former uh, directors that actually are Citizens Academy graduates, so I'm hopeful that that, that continues. Um, and again, I'm happy to answer questions, and I will just tell you um, from a sort of personal perspective, my staff loves this. We have we have participated in the, in the Transit Alliance Citizens Academy every single time it was offered in the eight, eight years I've been here, and it's really something that we really enjoyed. So I know we're, we're personally and professionally uh, excited about, about getting started. Mr. Albert. Albert, please. There you go. Did you say you already have some material available that I can take with me tonight? Uh, yeah, well, you, there should be at your uh, a basic one pager um, uh, in front of you, and I actually have extra copies. So some come grab me if you're like one is not enough. I want fifteen. Come get me. I actually have a stack. I have an opportunity well. tomorrow night. So cool, perfect. Thank you. All right, thank you. Albert. Yep. Thank you, Ms. Lindsay. We have a little motion picture problem, so we're going to go ahead without it. Okay. All right. Does can everybody hear me? Okay. All right. So, if you all have your packets, you can follow along um, for what I'm going to bring you through, and maybe Chuck will get the presentation up and running. Um, I'm Emily Lindsay. I'm a transportation planner here at Dr. Cog in the Transportation Planning and Operations Division. And I am working on the very first ever regional active transportation plan. So it's a really exciting initiative here at Dr. Cog and for you all. And the purpose of the plan is to develop a shared vision for regional active transportation, outline implementable strategies at the regional, state, and local levels so that we can all work together to build a robust active transportation network across the Dr. Cog region. So our study area for this plan is the, the bigger than the MPO area includes Clear Creek and Gilpin counties and Eastern Adams and Arapahoe. So it is a 10 county planning area for this process. Again, we know we're adding over a million people between now and 2040. So thinking about active transportation and getting folks out of single occupancy vehicles is really important for us to reduce congestion, increase air quality, um, and keep our quality of life. So there are a lot of important inputs to the active transportation planning process. Of course, MetroVision is number one. Um, but we're also reaching out to folks and conducting a full public input process. You may have seen us out at Bike to Work Day. We were at 10 stations across the region talking to folks about biking and walking in their communities. Um, working with state agencies and local folks to integrate your local plans. A lot of you guys have local bicycle and pedestrian plans already adopted or underway, so we're taking those into account as we develop this regional plan. Um, we're working with an active transportation stakeholder committee, and it's made up of representatives from your staffs um, and some local advocacy organizations. So of course, the connection to MetroVision is pretty critical and foundational for the active transportation plan development. And it really harkens back to the idea that livable, livable communities meet the needs of people of all ages, incomes, and abilities. And this is something that we'll talk about kind of throughout this planning process, but it's especially important to us as we kind of think about the big picture in active transportation. It, active transportation, you'll see, obviously, uh, relates to each one of those five MetroVision themes from land use, 
transportation, natural environment, livable communities, and our regional economy. You would see some really great stats up here. Uh, just picture this. 43% of all of the trips in our region, not just commute trips, are less than three miles. So 43% of those trips, less than three miles, extremely bikeable. It could be a good transit with walk trip. Those are our trips that we could look to potentially convert to biking and walking, or transit, obviously. Um, of all of our trips, 19% are less than one mile. So that's one in five trips are less than a mile. Um, so an extremely walkable and bikeable distance. Yeah. Thank you. So you were talking about that 43% that are less than three miles. How many of those trips are biking or walking trips? So is it we, still like the 12%? It's no, it's actually, it, there's a pretty good percentage of those trips that are biking, walking, transit, carpool. I would say about 50% of those are those drive alone trips. Um, and some of them are two. So it could be like a TNC kind of trip or Thank you. one of those. Um, but we will have the full suite of travel model data available for you guys once the plane comes. Sorry. Let's get this up and then you can see the see the images. Be helpful. Okay. Okay. This is what, what we were just talking about. So again, a big chunk of all of our trips are are pretty walkable, pretty bikeable. And these are the trips that we're really thinking about as we plan for active transportation across the region. This is not news to you all. Um, in Metro Vision, you all adopted a target to increase the amount of people that are taking non-SOV mode share to work to 35% by 2040. Today, we're at 24%, so we really need to do our, our part to get folks out of those um, single occupancy vehicles, consider smart commute options, whether it's biking, walking, taking transit, or carpooling. Another one of those Metro Vision targets is to have fewer than 100 traffic fatalities by 2040. Um, 2016, we had over 275 traffic-related fatalities across the Dr. Tug region, so we really need to do our part to make sure we're increasing safety for folks, especially as we consider active transportation. Bicycle and pedestrian crashes represent around 3% of all of our crashes across the region, um, but represent almost 24% of all of our traffic fatalities. So these are really vulnerable users of the transportation system that we need to take into consideration as we're designing and constructing facilities across the region. So this, these are some of the initial themes we've worked with our stakeholder committee on. Prioritizing safety is absolutely number one for everybody. And we keep coming back to this all ages, abilities, incomes, designing and planning a low stress network, a high comfort network for people um, so that they feel safe out there getting biking and walking. Um, integrating with local plans is of course uh, top of the list for us. So we've been working with your local planning staff um, to make sure that we incorporate that into our, our overall regional planning. Um, framework. We've been working with RTD to make sure we're considering first and final mile options and bike share, which has changed dramatically since the start of this project. Uh, so we're really looking at those forward thinking trends to make sure we're connecting all the dots with bicycle and pedestrian planning. So I'll give you a quick rundown here of some of the survey work that we've done. These are preliminary results and a full, full report will be available soon. But just to give you a sense of what's happening in the region right now, this isn't going to surprise anybody. We have residents that love to walk and bike for fun or for exercise, but they're currently not doing it for their utility trips to get around um, to places other than work to get to work. Uh, but they are getting out there. So they have bikes available. They have the willpower. They want to go for walks. They want to go for runs. So how do we make that easy for them to integrate into their daily lives? A lot of folks would walk more places if there were you know, more sidewalks, more shared use paths, uh, if the street lighting was, was better, if they felt safer from traffic. And again, you see the same trends across with biking more. Folks would feel more comfortable if they're separated from traffic, if they had that, that separation, whether it's a trail or barrier protected bike lane. And just to give you an idea of what that really means in terms of facility types, uh, not a lot of people feel comfortable biking um, when there is no bike facility present. This, it's not too surprising. Um, once you add a buffered bike lane, 40% of folks say that they would feel very comfortable. It's not a super high number, but where we really see people feeling more comfortable is in those separated facilities. It's those side paths, those shared use paths, those separated bike lanes. And what's interesting to us is on the right side of this, 
the shared use path and separated bike lane has the same percentage of folks feeling comfortable on those facilities. So as we think of the shared use path kind of to be the Cadillac, um, we're now realizing that separated bike lanes give people a high degree of comfort and they certainly cost a lot less. So some of the bicycle network planning principles that we'll be going through throughout the active transportation planning process are safety, comfort, and connectivity. Um, again, it's all about that separation from traffic, making sure that people feel safe to make the choice to bike. Um, giving them comfort in accommodating um, a variety of their needs and connecting them seamlessly from on and off street networks. And pedestrian planning principles, safety, comfort, connectivity, um, a little bit different, in, especially in terms of safety and as we think to intersection level, um, dedicated crossings, giving them some safe space um, in ensuring traffic calming and physical separation when possible. So some of the active transportation plan focus areas that we'll bring back to you all um, for some review are pedestrian focus areas. These are areas with a high concentration of existing or potential pedestrian activity. Um, short trip opportunity zones. These are areas that our travel model shows to have a concentration of high of short trips, two miles or less, which is right now the average bicycle trip in the region is 1.8 miles. So we consider that to be pretty, pretty bikeable and pretty walkable. And then the regional um, active transportation network, which is really going to focus on those high comfort routes that connect our regional destination. So think about these major shared use paths, the Cherry Creek Trail, um, Clear Creek Trail. And coming soon, we'll have a standalone bicycle and pedestrian crash report for you all to take a look at. This really does a deep dive into some of the factors that are causing safety issues in our region. Oh, God. All right. <laughs> there we go. Um, so that, that will be coming soon, so definitely look out for that. We, this is a 12-month planning process. We're about halfway through that process right now. Um, so we'll be back to you guys soon with an update. All right. Any questions for Miss Lindsay before the lights go out? I was just going to say, the air conditioning going off was a good thing. It's like an ice box in there. I've been trying since 6.30 to get it off, so at least we got it off. Thanks, Emily. Thank you. All right, Ms. Buck, we think we're finally up to you. Good evening, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner here at... Well, I'm just going to pull... Oh, good evening, Senior... Good evening, Matthew Helfand, Senior Transportation Planner here at Dr. Cog. Um, or maybe I will just... You're right. All right. Um, RTD is developing a prioritized list of potential corridors for bus rapid transit improvements. Dr. Cog's staff is providing technical assistance to this effort. And this evening, we have Holly Buck from FHU to discuss the study so far. Thank you. Okay, we're going to try and hit the high points for you so you can move on through your evening. We appreciate being here. Um, so as Matthew said, my name is Holly Buck. I'm with Salzburg, Holt, and Olivig. We're a transportation engineering firm located here in the Denver metropolitan area. I'm joined um, by Katie Dawson, one of my colleagues as well, who actually used to run um, the Citizens Academy and the Transit Alliance, so many of you may know her. Um, RTD, um, today I'm just going to hit on a bit about the project background and a couple of the really key findings that we have so far, which is they're very preliminary to date. Um, the intent of the project is really to look at investments beyond fast tracks, looking to bus rapid transit, and how we might continue to look to meet our growing mobility needs in the metropolitan area. We continue to have a lot of growth in the area. I think that uh, bus rapid transit provides us a good uh, efficient and cost-effective way to meet some of those mobility needs. I think so, in some cases we might find that there are other modes that we're looking to, but I think that RTD has really 
is looking to build out their rail investments that they have so far and are looking to look for some more cost-effective measures to meet some of the mobility needs as they grow in the region. So the goal of the study, as Matthew mentioned, is to identify and prioritize corridor-based and fixed guideway BRT projects in RTD's service area. We have put a project team together. We are the prime consultant, and we're working directly with Brian Welch with RTD. And we have several other national and local expertise um, experts that are also on the project, and you can see those here. We are about six months into the project, and we've identified an 18-month overall schedule. Thus far, we've done a lot of existing conditions and pulling together data, and the, what I want to focus on is showing you some of that preliminary data today. Matthew mentioned that we have a technical advisory committee that is uh, involved, um, Dr. Cog is involved in. We also have representatives, of course, from RTD and CDOT. And we're happy to be here with you today. Um, and we've been to see the RTC as well as the TAC. And we also met with RTD's local government um, uh, planning group as well. So a lot of, we've had a lot of outreach in the last month or so. A couple of the evaluation principles, I'm not going to go through these in, in detail, but these are really what are guiding our evaluation and development of potential bus rapid transit corridors in the region. A couple that I think are particularly important, everybody that we've met with thus far has asked us about um, technological innovation in smart cities, and I think one of the things that people have specifically asked about is you know, we're moving into this time of autonomous vehicles and all this technology. Will we still need BRT? Do we still need bus rapid transit? Do we still need buses? And our answer to that is yes, there is still a need in the future to have high capacity transit service as well as a variety of transit services to provide for different cost points and for, to provide for different origins and destinations. So while we anticipate being paired with a lot of technology, we do not see that transit would be going away. Your bus may in fact be autonomous someday, but we don't see that the bus itself is going away. The other thing that people have asked about is this adhering to FAST Act BRT definition. So the FAST Act from the Federal Transit Administration really identifies two areas for bus rapid transit. The first one is a fixed guideway BRT system. This is where the majority of the line is in a dedicated and exclusive right-of-way. The second one is a corridor-based BRT system where we have transit signal priority, we have defined stations, we still have frequent service, but you're not necessarily in that exclusive and dedicated right-of-way. So there's a bit of flexibility as we move forward on which types of bus rapid transit communities may have. And it's going to be different for each community what might work on their facilities. For the process, we've put together a four-tiered evaluation process. Um, the, first, the first step, uh, we're going to talk a little bit today about the candidate corridors in Tier 1, but the first step was really to identify in this huge set of, of roads that you may put bus ra rapid transit on, which ones do we think are actually reasonable candidates for consideration. That's where we started. The, net, the first tier of evaluation is to take all of those corridors and to identify which have the most potential for demand. So we'll talk about some of the criteria we're using there. The second tier is identifying where we anticipate seeing congestion in the future, because bus rapid transit is really going to do its best work when we can, not only do we have a lot of demand for that bus service and those origins and destinations that we're connecting, but we also have an opportunity to make that bus fast or at least competitive with the private auto. So if we know there's congestion there and there's a potential for us to implement some rapid transit measures, queue jumps, transit signal priority for the bus to go around some of that congestion, that's where we're going to see capitalize on that ridership and really lure people over to the bus, but not away from our active modes of transportation, of course. Um, and then the fourth is the or the third tier is to look at where is this actually viable. There's a couple ways for us to do this. Of course, we can, we can re if we want a dedicated lane, we can repurpose an existing general purpose lane. Don't panic. We haven't identified any place to do that yet, but we could. We can add lanes if there's right-of-way. 
And then if that's not an opportunity, there are, of course, those options for transit signal priority, queue jumps, something a little more localized with a little less impact to the community as well. And then finally, we're looking at uh, the final evaluation is really the prioritization, looking at the cost, effective, uh, cost effectiveness of each route and trying to identify which of those corridors that have been retained should be prioritized top for an RTD continued evaluation and investment. So candidate corridors, as I mentioned, we start out with all the roads in the entire RTD network and even beyond because we realize that corridor or communities that are outside of the RTD district today could technically vote to become members of RTD. So they may be in Dr. Cog, but outside of RTD today, but they could come in. So we really look at a bigger region than that. For you to be, for your corridor to be considered in the, the candidate corridors, we first said, if a community has done any kind of evaluation where they have recommended BRT for a corridor, we're going to include it and we're gonna look at that because the community has put that effort in and made that recommendation. The next thing, any RTD bus line that carried one million or more passengers annually, we included it because clearly there's some demand for that, for that service. And using Dr. Cog's regional 2040 travel model, we said any roads that carry 40,000 vehicles per day or more in 2040, we're gonna try and lure some of those people out of their cars and onto the bus if we can. So there's some definite travel demand on those corridors. And these are the corridors, and I think you have these in your handout as well, that came to the table as candidate corridors for potential consideration for BRT investment by RTD. So there is a way for you to provide me comments because I know we're getting late so I'm guessing we're not going to have as robust a conversation as we may have if it was earlier in the day. Um, this web link down at the bottom here and maybe we can send this out in the meeting minutes but this because it is just so long and not user friendly but this web link allows you to look at each of the candidate corridors. You can click on the candidate corridor, it will tell you why it's a candidate corridor and you can leave us comments about what you think about that candidate corridor. You can also leave us comments if you think there's something that we've missed and we want to hear that from you. This is a great time to do that. So we took those candidate corridors and we did our first tier of evaluation. And what we looked at here, again, remember we're trying to find those corridors that we think have the most potential for ridership. So what we have looked at thus far, and we have not completed this tier one analysis just yet, we're in the process of it. So there are a couple of evaluation metrics you won't see here, but we wanted to share what we have. The first is looking at each individual link of those candidate corridors. We looked at the population within a half mile buffer on each little link. This is 2040 numbers. We also looked at the employment then we looked at job density, so we looked at population plus jobs. I'll show you all of those tonight. We also looked at growth from 2020 to 2040. Now what you won't see tonight is the activity centers and those key transit connections. Those are the ones we're still working on, but I'll show you these other ones. So here's the analysis that shows in 2040, when we look at those little links and half mile buffers across the length, how many people, where do we see the concentrations of people? So the dark, the dark red is where we see the concentrations of people. The lighter is where we have lower density of people. I don't think there's any huge shocks in here. You see concentrations in Boulder. You see them in sort of central Denver area. You do see quite a bit over on the Aurora side. Then we look at growth. What's the population growth between 2020 and 2040? And I think this is really interesting because we need to understand where the growth is so we can try and plan for the bus rapid transit where people are moving into as well. So we know where people live today and where there will be concentrations, right, in sort of the central part of Denver. But we need to look to the future as well where people will live and work. Okay, so now let's look at employment. Here's 2040 employment. This is again all based on Dr. Cog's 2040 data set. And I think the next one is probably the most interesting to me, looking at the employment growth between 2020 and 2040. And you really see that 
down in the south corridor, I think it's really interesting to see the Lone Tree Parker area really popped out, the area along 470 really popped out. Um, you start to see some north in Boulder along the State Highway 7 corridor. So it's, it's pretty interesting how you start to see that distribution of employment going out in the outer ring as well, not just in that downtown Denver metro area. Um, and then this last one shows uh, population plus density. So any area, any segment that had a density of 17 jobs plus people, um, greater than 17 shows up in purple. And if it was less than that, it shows up in the light, the white color. So we did an initial test. Again, you have to remember that we have not finished looking at the key, the regional destinations, and we haven't finished looking at the key um, transit activity, so transit centers and connecting those. But when we did an initial test, we said, what if we just look at those top 25%, break them up into quartiles, what meets the top 25%, and this, the corridor shown in red, meet at least one of those evaluation metrics that we looked at they were in the top 25% of it. So a pretty good spread of around the region where you might expect to see activity. Again, there is a map where you can go in, dig into the data. You can look at the number of people that were along the corridor. You can look at the number of jobs along the corridor. You can leave me comments, and I would love to hear from you. Um, and we'll send this link out as well. This is a, a separate map. Um, so you'll, you can do these separately, both the candidate corridors as well as the preliminary tier one analysis. So we've got some next steps. I've mentioned that. And uh, when we get through the, the additional data that we're collecting, we'll put together routes. So we'll take all those individual segments. We're going to turn them into what we think could potentially be bus rapid transit routes. They'll be modeled by RTD. And then we'll start the tier two evaluation process. And I'm not going to go through all these, but these are, if you want to look at the details of the metrics that we have identified for each of the tiers of evaluation, these, um, these slides show that. And it's pretty interesting if you're into that sort of thing. We will be back, hopefully, uh, to see you um, again, towards the end of the year, we're anticipating uh, another round of um, reaching out to Dr. Cog, RTC, the board, and the TAC in December. And that's all I've got. That's about as fast as I can do. <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Christman. There we go. As you're looking at employment centers, are you also marking schools? Any of our high schools, um, our kids use mm -hmm. bus transportation. So we do have a data layer that is um, regional destinations, and it includes schools. I'll look to make sure that it includes high schools. It absolutely includes um, higher education facilities, but I'll look and make sure that that's the case. Mr. Brockett, it's a great question. My son rides the bus to, to school every day. Um, so there are two uh, corridors that are currently in the fiscally constrained plan, two BRT corridors, right? Oh my gosh, Brian would be so disappointed with me. I vowed to him that I would mention that, yes. Okay, so the in the candidate corridors, thank you. Um, we are not considering State Highway 119 and Colfax in this because they are both so much farther than this in the process. So they are there. They are assumed to be there in this analysis. But we are not stepping back to look at them just because you know, we are way in at 30,000 feet, and they are you know, moving into design. Answering my question. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the reminder. Speak Um I made a comment the other morning at the RTC. Um, but I want to repeat it because this is a difference. And that is that I'm from Broomfield and the corridor, the, and you did mention it briefly, um, State Highway 7, which is the Boulder, Broomfield, uh, Brighton cross thing at the north side of the uh, 
Octacog area and the RTD area. And while it doesn't meet necessarily the criteria for population, employment, and traffic, it's also the only route that is really a way to get from Highway uh, 36 to 287 to I-25 to 85 right. and to I-76. And there's enough activity that is occurring on that uh, corridor that it has potential that outweighs some of the criteria that's being used to judge which one is viable and not viable. And I believe that the uh, cities and counties that are along that um, very much wish to get that developed. And especially with the idea that there is going to be a huge transit activity at um, State Highway 7 and I-25 that would connect the Bustang and those items going up and down 25 with um, bus transit going across Highway 7. And right now the population and the growth and the industry development up there, I'm not sure is being predicted quite as accurately as it seems to be occurring because I know what's happening in Broomfield and, and everybody else up there is also experiencing the same thing, including uh, Thornton and Adams County. So sometimes the criteria gets to be too specific that it's a cookie cutting type of criteria. And I think the social impact and the action of the region from one side to the other uh, in the North should be a consideration in what makes something viable or at least worth looking at a little bit deeper and seeing if something can be true. Bring that up because it's often lost uh, in people I talk to that they don't even realize there's a road that you can actually take across. Right, right. So, it's not, sure. doesn't look like what it will look like in the future. Right, and uh, there is a lot of people and a lot of industry going up there. Yeah. In fact, I think Horton just had a um, Amazon place that started hiring 1,500 people there right at I-25 and probably 144. Yeah. Right. So um, it, it's getting extremely active up there. And just to, um, as an example, the South, when the tech center first started and everything, it, it moved along a little bit slowly. And then all of a sudden it got momentum and then it's just really steamed along. But what we need in the north is to also to have something that provides that momentum, helps that happens. So there's a, a two-way sword there, uh, but needs to be done and could be done. Um, I wanted to let you know too quickly that um, Boulder County staff reached out to me as well about some of that similar discussion. Walton. I'm from Lafayette. I would echo a lot of those, all of that. Just uh, also add to emphasize that um, a lot of attention is often given south there, but that east west is very. Lafayette, for example, really is impacted a lot by the traffic flowing through, and some of that may not pop up on some of these maps. Five on what data might be available. Look at that, or if you feel like it's satisfied, you know. A question though, on your actually, I'll follow up. In okay. Okay. There you go. So. The question that I have is: There like a timestamp on any any of these? Mm -hmm. Is it is it peak hours? Mm -hmm. And and just to echo on that, list, from the Inglewood station to at six thirty in the evening, one hour and fifty minutes. <laughs> I can get from the Inglewood station to Broomfield in less time. <laughs> That's a true story. Right. So. Okay. Is, is there like a time set? Because after certain hours in certain regions, 
there is no longer a bus along federal. They right. no longer are 20 minutes. Now it's become an hour and f- 10 minutes. And just to get up and down federal from Sheridan or um, Lisbon, um, down to say Denver, now you're waiting an hour and 15 minutes, hour 20 minutes for a bus, unless you gonna be right there when it's there. Um, so uh, is there a look at that as well, adding more routes um, closer together? Right. Is there a certain time that this was looked at? Okay, so from a frequency perspective, which is what we call how often the bus comes, to meet the federal definitions that we talked about with the fixed guideway or else being corridor-based, it has to basically run almost, it will be many hours of the day, like 18 hours a day. And it will have to have frequent service to be considered BRT. But 50, every 15 minutes, every 10 minutes in those peak periods, it will operate. Uh, in the off-peak, it can go down to 20 to 30-ish minutes and sort of depends on the line and the demand there. And that is important. Meeting that, that definition is important because that is how these lines could qualify for FTA funding. And so RTD is going to want, I mean, it, they may be funded in other fashions, but RTD is going to want to try to get funding, FTA funding. So it will be frequent, quite frequent, very good service that would be considered with these. Other questions for Ms. Buck? Ms. Dolzman. Thank you, Mr. Chair. So I just have one question. Is part of the scope of your project to look at how to fund the capital construction and the operation of these right. lines, or is it just to identify where these would be? We will, we will identify the lines. We will identify preliminary cost estimates. And part of our charge is to make sure that we are um, setting up the evaluation criteria for FTA to be as positive as we can to identify those corridors that have the most positive outcome. So we will not then go and actually do the application to FTA, but we will set RTD up with all the information that we'll need to seek that funding. Ms. Elrod? Okay. Any other comments or questions for Ms. Buck? Holly, thanks. Great. Thank you so much for having me. All right. We have one last thing to get through. Uh, it will be a quick uh, committee report. We have several committees that will not report. The Metro mayors did not meet. Uh, county commissioners also did not meet. Uh, RTD is not here. And Mr. Rakowski is going to do E470. Did not meet. Did not meet. Doing pretty good. Okay. Rack. Uh, well, the full rack did not meet. However, the, the subcommittee, um, who's responsible for the hiring of the new executive director for the Regional Air Quality Council, did meet several times. And uh, my understanding, talking to the mayor, that there is an uh, offer out. Um, they're going through background checks and that now. And I know that that position will be ratified at the July 27th meeting, which actually will be in this room. Um, so there you go. Uh, Mr. Papsdorf's stack. Grab a mic where you can find one, Ron. Problem. Um, I'll keep this brief. Uh, early in the week, we sent out uh, information to the board related to a special joint meeting of the Transportation Commission and the State Transportation Committee Advisory Committee that met this afternoon, um, beginning at 3, to consider uh, proposals from CDOT for a potential set of uh, a ballot list of projects for um, the sales tax ballot initiative that's anticipated in November. Uh, the ballot advocates had asked CDOT to develop a list of projects. The key issue that was under consideration was for many, many months, um, there has been a cooperative effort to develop a ballot list of state highway projects uh, to illustrate what projects could be funded if the, if the sales tax ballot initiative were to pass. That had been sized at about $6.2 billion uh, for bonded projects. Um, 
Upon further analysis, CDOT identified that that list could grow by about $800 million, and so there was capacity. So the big consideration today was what projects to add to the list to bring it to a $7 billion project size. The discussion was robust between the stack members and the uh, Transportation Commi Commission members, and ultimately I think they all reached consensus that they were the proposal was on track. The commission will consider that form that proposal formally at their meeting tomorrow morning, and I would expect them to adopt that ballot list uh, for state highway projects and the and the bonded um, multimodal projects. Warren, no meeting. meeting. Uh, one request that has come out from Dr. Cog that went out to all the regions that this is for the evaluation team. Uh, they made several recommendations in there, but we are, we're highly encouraging you that the person that you assign to help start the evaluation of the regional projects be your TAC member. They are already uh, greatly involved in what's going on. They're doing some of the reviews, and they are already identified as your technical experts from each of your regions. If you choose not to do that, please consider strongly who you will appoint, but that needs to be identified very quickly get that back to Dr. Cog so they can start being prepared once the project call goes out and the criteria and stuff starts to roll these in, we can get the evaluations done. So again, please respond to that uh, for, on behalf of your region, whoever your spokesperson is or your group. Try to get those back into us as soon as you can. There being no other business before the uh, authority tonight, if there are any comments from any members that we are missing, seeing none, please drive safe going home. If anybody needs validation for parking, please see Connie.